Good evening, everybody, and welcome to StatCheck episode 86. This is Wishing Upon a Balanced Meta. I am Ennis Wilson. I am joined by Nathan Statsdad, PhD, and Jeremy, who refuses to go by additional names, but some might know him as uh, Judge Curie and Executioner. Um, how are we all doing this weekend? Week. I'm I'm extra amused that we picked that title for this episode. And that's all. It was the only one suggested though as well. So I suppose that's why we picked it. You just want to do it. Um, Democracy works best when there's only one choice. <laughs> I <laughs> we're not. We'll talk about that some other time. Not right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> would you call that week, managed democracy? Uh, yes, I would. I mean, let's not rush about. Like <laughs> um, my. <laughs> My weekend was spent mostly doing D and D, and then putting together models to paint and priming models. I've got a void dragon over on my desk that I'm doing up, uh, and then I have an actual just Gundam model that I have to assemble, oh, yeah. which is really funny. Gundam models are some of the coolest models I've seen. It's like there are—I didn't know this when I was younger, and I had first assembled Gundam models, but there are like multiple grades of Gundam models, and I mm -hmm. got a master grade one, so oh, it's no. like a one 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 hundred scale, so it's like this big, nice. <laughs> and I'm pretty jazzed about assembling it actually, and then I'm actually going to paint it because I don't know why not. I don't think the Void Dragon is going to spin off into like a Necron army, but for the moment, I'm very excited to do that. And then I have a bunch of Soul Blight. Grave Lords models for Age of Sigmar because a bunch of my locals are picking up AOS apparently as we head into the fourth edition of that game. Um, I also played a 40k game, but I'm not going to talk about it because it was terrible. It was, was it just a, no, it involved putting 30 gene stealers on the line and then charging somebody turn one in us. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, we still can't talk about that until we have a really smart articles. That's why I said I'm not going to talk about any more of it than that. Exactly. That's very fair. Jeremy, uh, how about yourself? Uh, in my truest hobby ADHD, I picked up a T Suns army on Thursday night, and it's now almost completely assembled. I'm just waiting on a couple models to show up, and all primed. And I decided to go with the cutest color scheme, which is a I don't know how to call it Red magenta and... with teal, yeah, yeah, and then pink highlights, and then white gold for the medals. I love it. That is a great color scheme. What kind Magnus of this will be red though? Do? Hmm? Oh, the basing is going to be kind of like a desert stone and then uh, baby blue flowers. I you like should have it. to base every single one of the models with Liam VSL's face printed out. Um. <laughs> Someone get me a scan of his head and I'll and I'll like replace one of my sorcerers with him. Liam, if you're listening, we would love a scan of your head. Uh, <laughs> and you're off to an event this weekend, right? Yes, uh, this weekend I am heading off to Canhammer Team Tournament. It'll be the first time that I'm playing in a couple years because I judged it the last time. Um, going with um, the team that I've been playing with for the last couple years now, locally Blunt Force Drama. Um, we hilariously decided to grab Riley Tremblay from Team Canada from out in Saskatoon as well as his brother Rhett uh, to replace a couple of our players that couldn't make it this round. Uh, it's uh, 22 teams, 8 players, um, 5 rounds, WTC and player place terrain which was definitely a choice the pods yeah. of eight tables are four wtc tables of which two are medium and two are heavy and then the other four is the old terrain that we used to play on back in ninth that hasn't been seen since basically ninth well that's a lie i played it on i played on that terrain at capital city bloodbath and hated every minute of it um, well this will so. be good fun then Oh, it's going to be very fun because I'm bringing I'm bringing the Storm Raven list that I brought to my last two events, and uh... Storm Ravens just love wide open spaces that player placed in cards, right? Yeah, that seems terrible for them. I don't know why why you would do that <laughs> to win uh, ostensibly. That's the goal. We we were joking at one point that we, that uh, we want to see if we can pull the 160 Ooh. out of a round, which I don't think is possible, but a couple of my teammates think it is. I, I don't think I've ever seen a 160 in any... I don't think I ever have. I think the highest that I that any of my teams have scored in eight players is 125. I'm thinking back on, like, was, I'm pretty sure, like, America put, like, 150 on, like, Cyprus or something, like, the year before last, but... 
Yeah, it, it, Latvia, to be honest, it's really hard to push differential that hard and not give up like at least one or two per player across the whole thing. Like three or four 20s, that can happen. But eight 20s? Eh. So. Your opponent's bound to pair at least one match correctly. Yes. And like, while we do have some of the best players in the country on our team, many of the other best players in the country are also in attendance on other teams. It's just they don't have the same concentration of skill that we do. So there's definitely the possibility of one of us goes in and be like, oh, that's triple hammerhead Tau that we accidentally paired me into. I guess I lose. Yeah, that'd be funny. I would enjoy that. That would be very funny. That's like basically the one thing that in a competent T-Sense player, but they don't exist locally. <clears throat> they, they barely exist worldwide. Like, let's be real. I don't know. Alpine Cup seems to be quite a few of them. Yeah, there's like th all, all of the ones in Europe were there, though. Right? That's the, that's the <laughs> thing. So you have Arne, you have Liam, you have Brian. And Paul. And uh, that's that's it, right? Four, maybe? <laughs> and Brian isn't even European anymore. Well, he still lives here, right? I think that counts. Sure. I have him listed as United States in our stats now. That's probably wise, though. But do you have David Gaylord listed from New Zealand in your set? I do, actually. Okay, that's good. So we're considering. <laughs> if you have played on a national team, and I noticed that, I will put you in that with that nation. Oh, so where are, you, where are you putting Nick Nanavati? Uh, right now in the United States, because he hasn't played the WTC. <laughs> well, I mean, because he played for England. Yeah, but that was the ETC. That's different. Yeah, I know. Same difference. Back in the weird <laughs> okay, era. Yeah, USA put 135 <laughs> on Latvia. Woo, baby. Shout, shout out to Siegler and Naden for both dropping nine points. <laughs> Oof. Wait. That would have been back in 2019 then? 2022. Um, What about last year? They played Cyprus last year, right? Yeah, I, I've not looked at last year. I started with this year. Okay. <laughs> or with the first year. Innes, how about instead of <laughs> looking at his... How was order, your weekend, Innes? How was your weekend, you continue Innes? your screening? <laughs> Look, I went to Alpine Cup. It was... Fantastic. Um, love playing with the, the other. Uh, I, I think the technical name we're going by now is Killers Without Borders, but uh, that's a little cringe. So we're not using that one in public. Um, <laughs> although Brian did get art commissioned, which is hilarious. Uh, um, so yeah, that was myself, Typhus, Pumba of Stat Check, Anthony of this part of Stat Check, and also Brian Sype of um, Being Dead to Me. Uh, and we took our team out to the Alpine Cup, uh, which is a <laughs> Uh, 73 team, five team, uh, five player teams tournament in uh, Austria in Leoben, which I believe is going to be the venue for WTC for the next few years, which uh, I'll say some stuff about actually, because that McDonald's is going to do business. Um, so yeah, we, uh, we descended on Alpine. There was a singles event before the main event. Um, so it was a singles event and a team event. Um, I think the singles was like 130, 170 players, something in that region. 163, I think, by the number that I have in the chart. Um, which was a six round. It was a five round tournament with a top two, uh, which was Liam VSL from Team Belgium against Paul Neuberger from Team France, which was uh, Liam on Eldar, Paul on Thousand Sons, and Liam managed to take that one home, getting his his gold at his first Alpine Cup. Um, unfortunately, none of us took part in the singles. It's it's a long time to be away to do like five days. Um, because Leoben is, it's like in the, given the name, it's in the Alps. It's quite hard to get to. You're like, you fly to Vienna, which isn't really a direct flight from a lot of places in the UK, at least. Um, and then you, you know, you spend a couple hours in the car or you travel like on the train. It's the same thing back in the morning. Like it's, it's pretty far away from like any major airports. So it's kind of, if I wanted to do that, it was a like Wednesday through Monday commitment, like, which is like a full week, which is, you know, pretty rough. So we just did Friday to Monday um we ended up taking a team which was myself on blood angels as a sanguinius anthony on his eponymous world eaters we had typhus on uh sisters of battle we had pumba on death guard which is really confusing when you have typhus and death guard but they're not they're not together um pumba obviously doesn't run typhus in his list because he's already got him on his team uh and then we had brian on a thousand sons um we managed to so we won this tournament last year which obviously we were going in with uh all of the level of shit talking and smack that's inherent with that uh, and unfortunately, we couldn't quite convert this year. We did unfortunately go down in round four to the England Lions, captained by Manny, along with Alex Harrison, Nassim, Josh Roberts, and Nathan Roberts. Uh, they put up a blind of a round. They 
definitely out Paradise, which is super awesome. I'll touch on it a little bit more after we've done the stats and stuff like that, because I think that's one of the more interesting to talk about, along with balanced data sleep predictions, now that we've had a confirmation that's coming. And those are going to be the primary topics for this week. But all I'll say is, I played five fantastic games. Sons of Synchronies are so much fun to play. Um, I felt like I speed run almost every game to the point where Joel was like, yeah, we're not putting in this on stream because the game will be over too fast, which is one of the one of the nicest things anyone ever said about me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, instead we got Titus on stream that round to make sure it ran all the way to time. Uh, <laughs> that was very funny because there was that that game. I don't know. I was watching so much of it and there was a lot of back and forth. I haven't I haven't watched it, unfortunately. Um, I heard, all I heard was Typhus' side of it, but I'll be, be curious to hear um, what your thoughts were on it um yes james we have had a confirmation it was at the bottom of the kill team metal uh metal watch article they were like and uh we'll be back in a few weeks when the uh 40k balance data slate is out so which good luck to be fair lines up with what they've said because they've exactly said quarter they've said quarterly the last one was the end of january so sometime around the end of april beginning of may is when we can expect the next one yep so and they have confirmed i believe that it's points only which is what they said in the um initial announcement of balanced data slates this edition is that it was going to be rules changes every six months and points quarterly which so, they kind of I mean, threw out in the first couple but I, i'm gonna go with the first one was like uh like this is the initial like balancing not a balanced data slate and that there was also there was like a second oh yeah for sure like the, the september one was a we need to fix all of this yeah so we'll use the three months to do everything january was the this is the first real balanced first slate, balance slate yeah. and as we're going to talk about today they did a pretty good job of it Oh, and USA round one against Cyprus was 148 points this year. Ooh, 148? 148, yep. That is rude. Which was also the highest of the year. Shockingly. So yeah. We've not even we've not even seen a 150, let alone a 160. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 148 is wild. That means they average one and a half points each against USA. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have a look at the round and see if anybody lost their game, because that would be funny. Hope it's Anthony. I know that's the round that Anthony Abbott on somebody, but yes, I think Anthony got a twenty in that round. Yeah, Anthony Abbott. On. Anthony's Abbott on. That was the round. Whatever he does, the story about the um, the Wraith Knight and the Wraith Guard that both had the choice of phantasming away from Abbott on, uh, but they being like an easy charge anyway. That's the game he's talking about. So makes sense. Shall we hop into stats and then uh, talk a little bit more about Alpine Cup and then what we're hoping to see from the balance days harpster dropped six ridiculous maybe at the very end we can talk about previews from today if we want yeah although mostly i think it's just whying at the top of our lungs <laughs> for 15 Fox minutes <laughs> and that all right um so this weekend there were 15 events um i don't think it's going to take a lot of guesses it? with yeah, it's a lot of events, actually, when all things are considered. We're kind of back after the Easter-like decline, so we're bumping back up again now that people are going back to events instead of, I guess, going to be with their families or something like that. I don't know. Terrible, really. Um, the top performing faction of the weekend was Necrons, kind of unsurprisingly. 83 players, 9.6%, a 59.9% win rate, three event wins, 13 top fours, 25 top 10s and a 2.3 over rim. Necrons are probably the faction that is just the most out of whack at the moment. There's probably some other stuff in. Wow, Tim Penny, did you just give us $20 to WA? I refuse. No, he gave principle. $20 for himself to WA. And I'll actually acknowledge it. I actually, you know what? I will WA when I play Tim at Canhammer Teams this weekend. I love it. Please do it. All right. The second best faction. Oh boy. Okay, spreadsheet. The second best faction of the weekend was a Gene Steeler Colts with six players. <laughs> Go, Gene Steeler Colts. And that's all I'm going to say about them. They did win an event, though. That was their first event of, I think, the slate since the slate happened. It's yes, it is their first event since the slate. Before. And I'll also add that in the last two weekends, they have managed three top fours, which is more than they managed in the 11 weeks before then. Yep. Which was. Uh, zero. Their win rate was 58.3. They have a 2.45 over it because there are only six of them, which is 0.7% of the meta. And because just one of them won an event top forward and therefore top 10 it, uh, that just spikes their over through the roof. It's just uh, it's just what it is. 
In third place, we have Thousand Suns with 32 players, 3.7% of the meta, 57.8% win rate, three top fours, six top tens, and a 1.38. Thousand Suns, quietly good if you're good at the game. I don't know. That doesn't sound right. No, not even a little. Um, then the Eldari are in fourth place or third place if you discount Gene Steeler Colt, 5.5% of the meta, which is really interesting to see because at one point they were flirting with 10 and now they're back to normal-ish numbers. Look, Liam's just proven people can still win Super Majors with them, so we'll, I'm sure we'll see them everywhere again. Yeah, 55. Point, the army's still broken, guys. Who'd have guessed? It is still real good. 55.4% win rate, two event wins, six top fours, 13 top tens, and a 1.84 for overrep. Real good. Uh, then it's Custodes, 74 players, 8.5% of the meta, a 54.2% win rate, two event wins, six top fours, 16 top tens for a 1.19 overrep. Almost balanced. Almost. And then our actual top five. In fifth place was Adeptus Sororita, Soror Sisters of Battle, at 2.9% of the meta, a 53.3% win rate, no event wins, one top four, nine top tens, and a 0 0.59 for overrep, proving that sometimes, you know, good factions just don't do well. And then who wants to predict the worst faction of the weekend this weekend who is not Jeremy, because Jeremy looks at the number spreadsheet. I can so say it's not going to be surprising Do you want me to guess all. what the worst faction is? Yeah. You so get three Padme guesses. Or demons. No, and oh. no. Hmm. Admech had a 45.8% win rate this weekend, and demons had a 46% win rate. It's actually Chaos Space Marines with 23 players and a 38.5% win rate. Uh, and guys. no overrep. <laughs> Uh, Imperial Knights are second from the bottom at a 40.7% win rate, but they got three top tens. And then Astra Militarum are third from the bottom. <laughs> Which will never not be a little funny. Uh, 50 players, 5.8% of the meta, a 42.3% win rate. An event win courtesy of Ben Jurek, I believe, from this weekend. As friend of the show, so good job, Ben. Four top fours, six top tens, and a 1.18 overrep. Which is really, honestly, this faction's doing just fine if you look at the numbers that aren't win rate. Like, if you just look over at event wins, you look at top fours, you look at over rep, everything's fine with this faction. Their win rate is just abysmal. So basically, yep. everybody either goes 5-0 and oh or 1-5 and five with them. Yep, apparently. Yeah. I mean, that is a... Six, uh, that's like a 60% win rate almost. Yeah. Uh, also, shout out to Ben Yerk. That was a fantastic game to watch on stream at the end. If anyone wants to go watch a... Okay. But. Very hilarious game between Eldar and Gard. Um, go fun. check out Tabletop Live. They were streaming the game. Uh, the event, which and the event, which amused me so much because they're up from my neck of the woods up here in Ontario. And Scorched Earth, which was the event that uh, Ben won, was down in Arizona. Mm. Like, Why is that going on? <laughs> and then Tyranids are fourth from the bottom. 40 players, 4.6% of the meta, a 44.3% win rate. Still no event wins since the balance data slate. One top four, six top tens, and a 0 0.37 for overrep. And then Drukari round out the bottom five. 33 players, 3.8% of the meta, a 44.9% win rate. No event wins, no top fours, three top tens, giving them a net zero for overrep. Uh, the other GT winning factions, I believe, are, are Orcs. Space Marines with two, Death Guard with one, Chaos Knights with one, and Grey Knights with one. So those are your event winners from the weekend. Just at least turreted suck. I'm just, I can believe that maybe there's a buff coming. I would I'll, believe I'll, it. I'll be letting. <laughs> like, I would believe that there's something, but I mean, there's a certain point where you're just like, so you get a free brood of everything. Here's a free gargoyle okay. unit. Here's a free termagant unit. Like, Here's a free hormagant unit. <laughs> you get a red carnifex unit actually. Which is just a point of strength whenever you're in synapse range. And I had to be like, you know what? I'd kill for that. I would there's a lot of things I'd kill for in that book. AP, a more interesting play style than just using biovores to try to score behind enemy lines repeatedly and forever. Yeah, but they're so good. Um, they are very, it hasn't changed. Yes. No, no, I, I gotta address this. Yes, but James, he's saying they rewrite the harvester and crusher stampede detachment entirely. Um, yeah, but harvester, the assimilation swarm. Went five and one this week in a scorched earth. I'm so clearly, sure that it's fine. I just brought the day he owns, and I don't think that was <laughs> oh a real God. list. All right, there is 
there's a few more stats things we're going to talk about that don't involve this week because while week to week data is fun and awesome because we get to celebrate people like Ben McJurick, who's in our chat right now winning an event <laughs> every time. I love it. Uh, instead, we're going to talk a little bit about how the meta as a whole is doing. So I'm going to share my screen, which everybody seems to enjoy. I think this is my favorite part this is me getting to boomer my way into sharing my screen. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to share first is this, which is just the metadata dashboard or at stat-check.com slash the dash meta. And mostly the meta looks pretty healthy, actually, from just looking at the data since this last data slate. You really only have one faction above what we consider the balance win rate window of 55 to 45 and only have three factions under it. Uh, one of those factions is Space Marines, one of them is Death Watch, and one of them is Chaos Space Marines. And then you have some factions that are kind of sitting here right on the edge, although Imperial Agents is not a real faction, but somebody didn't play them, so that's what you get. I mean, whoever's playing them is better than every Death Watch player out there. That's a reasonable that's, part. They're all, all, there's only all like 36 Death Watch players. Let's not get too excited. Um there's no surprises kind of in this data. Necrons have a 57% win rate. They have more event wins than the next uh, three factions combined. Maybe, f well, no, the next four they have the exact factions. same as the next three factions. Yep, combined. Right. I'm, I'm like trying to do math real quick in my brain and can't do addition. <laughs> the only thing that I find ever so troubling about this, although custodies are getting a new book really quickly, is that 18% of the meta is the top two factions in this game. That's yeah. a lot. Changes need um, to happen. One, Yep, some changes need to happen, but for the most part, this looks pretty good. Um, there are some it's pain good points. If you ignore that the Necrons exist, yeah. Yeah, there are some pain points um, in this data that we'll talk about in like a little bit, but it's not like major pain points. There are some pretty minor pain points that are coming out of this. There's a lot of overrep that's kind of sucked up by the top performing factions, leaving kind of the middle factions with not a lot of overrep. So there's a lot of top four placements that are just kind of absorbed by the top third of the meta, essentially. Which, if you keep promulgating that down, that's great. Because when we first started 10th edition, it was like one faction with all the top fours. And then we shifted it to two, and now we're shifting it to like nine. And then eventually we'll get to like half and it'll be great. Every every time we're going to get a little bit better. Um, and that's the hope at least. And then to kind of visualize this a little bit differently, we're going to look at the whole of 10th edition because I think this is the fun and most dramatic version of this, which is also on the dashboard. Because you get to see how wild and dangerous 10th edition was initially. Um, and it never is not fun. It's going to hurt. Um, it is going to hurt. So, Look at this spread early on in the meta. Like, look at it. Look at it and weep when you have Imperial Knights at a 71%, Eldari at a 66%. Uh, oh. Somewhere down here is Death Guard at a 21%. This this spread is hilarious. Um, yeah, the first it, three months of 10th were... I was very glad that it was WTC. I was also very sad that it was WTC, but I was glad that it was mainly was team prep that I could get ready for. Going. Yeah, was, uh, exactly. WTC. <laughs> right around September is when things started to like dramatically tighten. Um, well, that was the so first like, big slate. Yeah, so this is the first slate, and you see all the numbers kind of tighten. You see all there kind of get a resurgence kind of very briefly. Um, and then they get tamped down again with the second slate, essentially. Um, and then now we're kind of coasting off of the third slate. We're on the third one, right? And I can never keep track of this anymore. Uh, we're Next. heading into the third real slate because the, the edition came slate. out in June, end of June, first beginning of July. We had a couple little oopsie tweaks in the meantime. The like that, update, thank God. The towering <laughs> update. Yep. The towering He's... points update. And then September, we had our first real slate where they fixed a whole lot of things that were either like not working properly on rules interactions and also like hit some factions really hard, but also brought up a lot of factions. That was also when then... the dev wounds change. Yes, that was the Dev Wounds change, which was probably the most impactful, as well as the Overwatch change, if I remember correctly. Yes. That was no Overwatch with Titanic units. and No Overwatch with Titanic units or Indirect. While it's yeah, indirect was the big one. Mm -hmm. uh, and then after that, it was... Marines, January... rest of these. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be honest. We're glad so, they're gone. Currently, we're on this chunk right here um so basically february through now 
And we are supposed to see a balanced data slate in the next few weeks, essentially. They said next couple of weeks in the kill team preview where they talked about the kill team data slate and stuff like that. Um, and honestly, the only faction that needs like the biggest of tweaks because custodies and orcs have books, so they don't really need tweaks at this exact moment is Necrons who need tweaks. That that line is just terrifying. Yeah, this line is amazing because this is when they got nerfed with the mortal wound change and stuff like that. So they dropped a little bit and they've just kind of slowly been coming back up anyways. Yes. Um, Look, I don't know what you want to call an AP6 Plasmancer if it's not mortal wounds, but... <laughs> I don't know. You still get an invulnerable <laughs> save. Yeah, but it sure doesn't feel like that when you're getting, when you're losing your land raider to it. Here, here's the Eldari one, just for funsies. I mean, I feel... See, this is the thing. I think Eldar are actually in a... I, I hate to say it, in a fine spot. Yep. However, are finally kind of we can, we can knock them below control. the 50 line, keep them above 45, but knock them below the 50 line for like the next three months. They are under the 50 if line. They're under the 50 line right now. Keep if we can them there. The spider data sheet, I agree with you. <laughs> OK, all four trolls should die. Let's go with that. If Shadow Spectres and uh, all resin, in fact, no resin in 40K. If it's a resin model or data sheet. It should get removed. Let's see if I can so Gene Sealer Coulter in here, but that's kind of the big one. Imperial Knights have had a, like apparently a ray <laughs> major like towards bounce back, and then they gave up halfway. That's, they're having one an identity crisis right now, weeks, or like Adepticon happened, and there was no terrain, and like or like an Adepticon equivalent. Hey, Adepticon I mean, Adepticon's had... terrain was actually fine this year. Yeah, not Adep not actually Adepticon, but like there was just some tournament that had like no terrain, and that's had a massive impact on it. And now we're back to normal. Uh. There are actually too many symbols too close together now to actually do this properly. That's how good the meta is, apparently, is all the symbols are stacked on top of each other. So Which I no longer... Grab? I can grab it. It's just... I'm just being funny. There's world leaders. World leaders can't decide what they want to be anymore. They just I... have to jump every time Anthony realizes they're playable. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> all right, where was... So the September slate kind of fixed the meta for them because Custodes got taken out back, or at least the Custodes build that was yep. punishing them. They also got some big buffs. Which is mm -hmm. right there at the start of that massive climb. Yep. And uh, then they stay exactly as they are until right after Cali yeah. Cup. <laughs> and then well, no, Cali Cup was back in October. Exactly. So like a month after Cali Cup, at the start of like the... December, they start dropping because Anthony starts playing singles. <laughs> and then they kind of stay in the doldrums. And then th that's. I mean, the this slate. is the balance window. They're and then balanced. They down, and then yeah. Anthony realizes they're good again, like three weeks ago. And now they're good. <laughs> hey, Adam. It's good to see you. Uh, it was great being on the show. Um, yes, keeping Anthony angsty is good for business. That's why we don't have him here this week. He'd be too positive after Alpine. We can't have Anthony on and having fun. It's true. He's If he's too fun and happy, it's no good for any of us. And then here are orcs who are also getting a book soon, having dropped into kind of the bottom five region, bottom ten region of the stats for a little bit. Um, you should look at Death Guard. Death Guard is a wild ride, but also just go. Like, feels Here's so Death Guard. Good. Here's Death Guard. Just a general walk towards balance and then sticking right around 50%. You know what, Death Guard players? This is great. Um, so yeah, I am actually... I know that we give GW uh, a hard time regularly for a lot of the decisions that they make, um, but the balance of this game has been... has gotten a lot better since the beginning of the game. Uh, although the beginning of the game is also their fault. That's all I'm going to say. Like, they, they don't get to... Here's Chaos Face Marines, because somebody was complaining about it in chat. Um, <laughs> Go. <laughs> and Just then, that free fall. And then because Adam Camilleri asked so nicely and called me Pappy, I will find him the card stats. Uh, there they are. <laughs> this is the guard fine. stats. They're fine. They're in the balance window. They're flirting with disaster a lot. But like we talked about, the reason that win rate is a weak statistic is it doesn't account for other things. And one of the things that you need to account for is, is that faction winning event? Is it winning events and beginning top fours at the rate that you'd expect for that faction, given its player population? And the answer for guard is that, yes, guard are fine from a overrep and GT winning perspective. They have they're fine from a win rate perspective right here. Like they're within yes. that 45 to 55 window. Like as much as everyone wants every single one of their factions to be above 50%, we can't have that. 
True. Like it's statistically Star impossible. They, like internal balance changes, not external balance changes. The power level sure. of guard is guard needed attachment that doesn't encourage them standing still. Yes, but that would I also be cool. Refuse to accept playing against <laughs> attachment because I can have bullard or better. So I kind of like. <laughs> Look, man, I would I love say, nothing more than an, a detachment rule that doesn't benefit me for just sitting in one spot. Do you want to play against non, in, like, indirect guard? Stop giving us weird detachments that are only about standing still and shooting indirect at people to get rerolls. Or get right, two things that I want to show off right here right now. One, notice how guard actually went up when Manticores got nerfed in Janu at the end of January. Yeah, because yeah. people were like, oh, we very we slightly. <laughs> no, but like the, they were sitting oh, here, below the 45 yeah, 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 yeah. after that. They're now sitting it's above because <laughs> it's because people took basilisks and started to take Kasserkin and things, I think, after that, exactly. probably. They're like, well, I can't afford to spend 800 points on indirect, so I guess I'll just cut a basilisk. And then they cut the second one as well. And they were like, I should play three mana cores. This is way better. <laughs> so now here's the fun one looking at the whole picture. So unselect that. Come on. One of the Come one on. of the things there that we, we added early last week was the ELO filter. What happens if you take this graph and filter it by like the top ten percent player, so ninety and ninety? Oh man, this is where things get weird. This is a very this is not a large population Small of players. Small data set. <laughs> this is where things get wild though, because this is like <laughs> four hundred fifty seven games played. Yeah, the top ten percent of the meta, it's wild, wonky, oh, and wait, that, kind of strange. Who's that at the bottom, like just cratering off the, <laughs> the Chaos Space Marines? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Chaos Space Marines falling <laughs> off the planet. Um, you have Tau here. Like, there's a, the top ten percent of the meta is weird because there are only so many people in the top ten percent. Can we you just zoom in a little bit on the like right hand side? Please don't. Like, make who, me who's zoom the in top five this. in this? Uh, sisters, um, sisters, Grey Knights, Grey Knights Space Wolves. Space. Wait, what? Wolf jail. Space Wolves, jail. Necrons, and Tau, I believe. Uh, I think it's actually, well, I think they're all kind of sitting in there. Actually, you can just look at it by looking at the, the state of the game one and doing the same filter because then you can yes. actually look at what this is oh, actually the better <laughs> way to do this. <laughs> right. So I personally think 70% is the right cutoff if you want to look at this, but no, no, 90%. Let's put it at 99. Just so so the thing is, is that 90% is over 4,000 games. It's not a tiny, it's not a, it, like, it's still a, a smaller sample set, but like Sisters is still 170 games played. Yeah, it's not. I mean, Guard is 200 games played. So, yeah. like, this captures the majority of people who have won GT sized events as well. So, I'm not like complaining. I just, I think to, to that it's too small, but it is a better indicator of how the top 10 of the game is going being played and who is playing scroll up again i sorry is there a reason that csm is different on the win rate here than it was on the chart uh the win rate on the chart is a, a four-week four week running week. average four week running yeah. average Got it. this is just the average since the last slate whereas the other one's a four week running average uh james works up to answer your question the thickness of the line in the chart represents the number of games played so if you have two selected at the same time the relative thickness between them will tell you which one is being played more so I like 70, but that's just me. I we could just do 75, top quartile. Fine, if we want to be like, like, like reasonably like scientific about it. It's also it. because, spoiler alert, that's what we're most likely going to be using for the updated peer versus peer chart as we've been working True. on in the background. I think Cliff said that he actually put that up. Oh, click on the peer versus peer, see? Yeah, let's find out. I thought he said he was putting it up. Maybe he didn't yet. <sighs> nope, not yet. All right. All right. Well, I lied to all of you. I'm not sorry. Um, so this is the top quartile, essentially, where you have Sisters of Battle. Um, you have Necrons, Tau, Grey Knights, Black Templars, and Adeptus Mechanicus. Although Adeptus Mechanicus is like it's 108 players. games played. It's 108 it's, games played. Like that it is, is 108 game played. Like yes, it is. That not is an as many as like it's a small sample size, but it's still very funny that it's that high. They've also won three events. They have. Um, the only factions that haven't won events are since the slate is this is Chaos Demons and Tyranids and Death Watch. Although Death Watch is also Death Watch 14 players in the in this even in this data set of 75 of the top quartile of ELO scores. 14 players with 50 games indicates a lot of drops from events as well, by the way. <laughs> well, no, because yeah. remember this is just gonna be the 75 into the 75. So when that yes. Death Watch player inevitably oh, loses yeah. round one, they immediately go into the 50 for the same bracket. 
Mm-hmm. It's the death watch <laughs> player and the CSM player, top 10 survivors at Elo, just playing each other in the two and two and three bracket. Yeah, that's exactly what this those games are. <laughs> Maybe. And then this is where uh, one of the jeans. Alex this is where says that one jeans won an event is. this weekend. What mm-hmm. event was that? Because I don't have that. I think it was twenty. It was like twenty four players or something like that. Oh, that'd be why because it doesn't hit my there. criteria. So one of the things to remember is that as stat check, we only and have said this since the beginning. We only track twenty five plus player, five plus round events. We don't track anything smaller than that. Only things bigger than that. So while we would love to keep up with all the smaller GT size and large RTT size data, we just can't. That's too much work. That opens up your data also to all sorts of weird stuff beyond that. Um, so we don't do that. We track just GT plus sized data, which is for us 25 plus player, five plus round. Um, yeah, it was a 22 person uh, event in San Antonio, Texas. And that requires 25 people to be to actually play the event. Um, a lot of events have 25 people registered and then have like only 22 play. So, yeah. Uh, whereas so Chaos Knights did win a very large event this weekend, and that was pretty cool for them because that was their second win of this meta. CK are fun. I like that army. They're pretty cool. So, the summary and take home message, I think, from the stats section today is that the meta is better than it was there's still room for improvement and there are like are signs that there are potential problems but there's nothing egregious anymore like the meta it has definitely healed substantially from where it was at the top of 10th or even in the middle of 10th 10th's first year essentially like we're getting a lot better we're not even a year into 10th we got two whole years where we can have maybe a potentially much more balanced meta situation although a lot of books haven't come out yet so who knows if we get another we're Necron get book run over by bad Trajan? No, yeah, we're going to get run argue. over by Dread Mob. Uh, I don't know. I'm kind of excited by the idea of getting run over by big stompy robots that look like they're made out of children's toys. I swear, Those if they stompa, make the Stompa good, one shot itself. I don't think so. I'm going to have to look up how many guns a Stompa has because if it's got hands on ones or twos, I want to see if a Stompa can kill itself. All right, so. <laughs> One of the things that they preview, so let's just talk about previews while we're here, and then we can move into Alpine, and then we can talk about meta meta wish listing stuff. So they previewed Adeptus Custodes, they previewed one detachment today, itself, and then they previewed one. They previewed multiple detachments from Orc. Sorry, I got like majorly spun out from something somebody said in chat. Um, <laughs> But one of the things that they did in the preview before on um, during the pre-order notification announcement is they showed data cards for uh, Gaz and they sh- showed one for Trajan. And they showed that Trajan has A, lost his once per game fight first. And they also showed that Trajan only gets his unit to ignore hit, ballistic skill, and weapon skill modifiers and nothing else anymore. I did, Grant, I did in fact get stunlocked. Sometimes if you ask questions during... Me talking, I will get stunlocked by them. Today is so the Gaz n- Gaz no longer ignores weapon or uh, damage modifiers. So Trajan, all of you, Trajan, yes. What I said, Gaz. Said Gaz. Man, I'm, <laughs> I'm having a bad day apparently for my brain. Whereas Gaz's preview, he's <laughs> the same as what he did before. Did before, but he also got a sweep attack that's damage two. As ask me how I feel about the line sweep becoming damage one again. Um, Cause it's like 12 attacks at 16. Does Gaz again. also have the infantry keyword? Yes. He's, he's, he's always had the infantry <laughs> keyword that didn't he's change. Also like twice the size of the lion, just physically. Uh, it, yes. And, and also <laughs> he also had an additional rule added to him, which is the unit that he's leading during the law gets crit hits on fives, which is amazing. So wild. Definitely needed it, yeah, yeah. Uh, Gaz is terrifying looking. Uh, he should, yeah, you know he should be a monster and the line should be infantry. I mean, definitely. That That is 100%. Or just make all the models monsters. Make Xeris mod a monster. Make Abaddon a monster. No, just make every model of the game infantry. infantry. Just all yes. of them. We all go through walls now. And then they previewed a detachment rule for the mob menta- the green tide detachment, which is mob mentality, which is a five up and vulnerable save, and then reroll ones for your saving throws if your unit contains ten or more models, which is kind of fun. I don't know. That's... And then giving them that four and a half plus invulnerable save. Yeah. 
I mean, it's um, going to get real annoying when your opponent just keeps rerolling all their ones into fives. Yes. And it's then they definitely gave them... Like that, Will Gaz be able to join boys, though? I don't think that the leader section of his data sheet looks any different in that preview, but well, at the same time, it's also it's super blurry. Back, right? so. No, they, they're they now... because the So the indexes were, were two-sided. All of the new ones are single-sided cards. They, they moved everything around. There's a handful of them that don't quite fit. Um, I think Devastators come to mind because you just have too many warrior options. But most every other of the like codex data sheets are condensed so you can see everything on a single sheet, which is actually really nice. That is much nicer. And then they did add a regeneration so you can get D3 plus two boys units or models back There's to models. boys units. <laughs> models, yes, destroyed models. Oh, that would be bad. <laughs> oh, yeah. The other alternative would be bad. And then they gave the wordiest stratagem on the face of the earth where you can give units a three inch engagement range but they can only fight units that they are currently in engagement range of or three inch Which fighting. Good, they can fight within three inches. Just, just casting get over here. And like you're, yeah, so basically. you're in engagement range. <laughs> Everybody's in engagement range now. Congratulations. But my favorite is actually the dread mob detachment, mostly because it's rule is the best. It's just try that oh. button. It's try that button. And then mechs, orc walkers and grot vehicles get to either Roll a d6 and choose from, and then get one of sustained hits, one lethal hits, or uh, armor penetration plus two on a critical wound. Or oh, you, you can make your weapons in the original version, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and then oh, you can pick the the benefit you get if you choose hazardous for all of your weapons. And then if you already have hazardous weapons on your data sheet from either another stratagem or inherently on that weapon, you get ha your hazard tests fail on ones and twos, which. Can be quite dramatic, I'd imagine. <laughs> I'm just looking at the Morkanot data sheet right now and going, it has six guns and 20 wounds. And speaking of stratagems that give your guns out. hazardous. They both have um, six. I just don't finish checking. <laughs> I was just like, you can, I think that's the most like relevant relative damage you can do to yourself. This detachment is so much fun that it makes me want to play orcs because the next one is one CP for one mech orcs walker or Grotz vehicle unit to give it plus one to wound plus one damage, and hazardous for its ranged weapons. <laughs> this is such an orky detachment. I love it. And it I, also sounds uh, really good. I know. It just sounds so fun. I won't... The one thing about orcs is that if all of their stuff is fun sounding, that's what I love the most. And orcs are one of those armies that it, when their things are characterful and powerful, it feels really fun. Um, I'm hoping that we're not going to get another buggy army situation. I, but, well, they gave us the orc detachment gets an invol when it moves fast, so I'm assuming when it advances. Yeah. The last preview that they gave us was Cult of Speed, where they can give trucks and buggies a four up and vulnerable save just by going extra fast, which I assume means advancing. And then Bully Boys, which is the knob detachment, I'd assume, based on the information that comes after that. Sounds where they like can have double extra, wah. Extra wahs. So you, you can listen sure, to your that's opponent. Be fine. You can listen to your opponent wah multiple times at you. I'm going to kill someone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we did also see the list of data sheets, and it looks like basically all the resin characters have been Thanos snapped. So, yep. Rust and yeah. Pissed. But Tank Bust Madra. has lived. Aren't they in Don't the Looters kit? No, they're still fine cast. Huh. I thought they had a You're thinking? Kit. No, I, I I thought this too. Well, and then Burnus, isn't it? Yeah. It, yeah, Burnus. And uh, but yeah, so like, um, who's gone? Snickrot, right? <laughs> Captain Badrock, Badrock, um, Snickrot, Knob with War Banner, um, the guy with the Vulture Rock Claw Snick. Talons, right? Z uh, Zogrod, you know, all of the smudge noddles. Zen no, Zogrod's Starway. still in there. Oh, Zogrod works I mean, Naga, the uh, the guy that gives your your idiot Gretchen a scout nine. I, mean, I made up, I made up a word there, Jeremy. That wasn't a real data sheet. Please don't think I was. <laughs> <laughs> that is the funny part about that Orc was, data sheet. That is actually a character in the book. In the book, <laughs> um, I was talking about the vulture guy. That one, the storm oh, boys character, Zagstruck. Zagstruck. Yes, he's gone. According to Does multiple this mean, people, in chat. Uh, Ben is going to be playing orcs again. I'm so That's what it sounds like. Fuck that guy. Um, and then I the on the other end of fr down from this really high high of the orc preview where they got a bunch of characterful stuff 
Warhammer community put a lot of effort into like their article with a bunch of previews for all the different mechanics of the army and stuff like that. Uh, we got the what if I copied your homework but not well version of it for custodies today where they previewed a detachment and then told us that the current index detachment got completely rewritten but no other information about it. Um, and in this one, the detachment rule is revered companions or anathema psychana units, which is Sisters of Silence units, gain the null agus while an adeptus custodies unit is within six inches of this unit. Models in that unit have a feel no pain of a five plus against psychic attacks and mortal wounds. And then all other adeptus custodies units from your army gain uh, while an anathema psychana unit is within six inches of this unit each time a model in that anathema psychana unit makes an attack, they get plus one to their hit roll, essentially making them a two up ballistic skill, two up weapon skill unit instead. Um, and a, bunch of shit a bunch of really good stratagems that you can use on two <laughs> units if one of them's a Sisters of Silence unit. Uh, there's like a move and some crap with plus one to wound and shooting only, or plus, plus one, one to strength, strength, and, strength and armor only. penetration. It's yep. damn awful. It's uh, double tapping Draxus unit. <clears throat> could be sure, good bro. whatever whatever you want man yeah. plus one strength plus one ap is not bad for a cp at all but it's and the reactive shooting. move like, yeah custody's infantry shooting is not good no Look, i guess just stick a stick gray facts in a squad of 10 uh prosecutors <laughs> to replace what the they get dev wounds <laughs> it'll be great i promise look because those rules look <laughs> dog shit i'm 50 like, percent confident that those are the best rules in the book because if they weren't, they would show off other stuff. That's I'm a, sorry, Custodes players. Go ahead, Jeremy. That's a terrifying idea, in and I, uh... They showed off all the cool. They showed off all the coolest rules in the New York book, and all the coolest rules in the New Custodes book. <laughs> yeah, the the worst part though about the Custodes preview is that it feels like just so minimal. They only have four detachments, I guess, in the new book, based on the um, preview that we've seen so far. Yep. Whereas yeah, the, uh, the pure the video pause. Whereas orcs have six, and um, so I guess that just is a reason to preview yeah, one material. The four but that they had were revered companions, um, which is talents. the or talents of the emperor. Sorry, is the one uh, null maiden ho detachment, which is I'm going to guess pure sisters of silence, which is why. <laughs> Uh, or champions, one. which we don't know what it is, uh, and then shield host, which we knew what it was, but it's they say it's unrecognizable basically now. So yeah, it's like if they've written a whole detachment rewritten. just recruit. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that recruit detachment um, could actually work though. I know it's like if they wrote a whole detachment for recruit, but didn't release the crew army box. Let's go with it, that. Yes, now they, they need to bring over some Horus Heresy, like Sisters of Silence stuff, like the special vehicle and stuff like that. The, the special character units as well and things like so you all have i'm really waiting more for is the announcement that all of the like the four drill data sheets are gone as well with the index update that's like the <laughs> last thing i need ben ben mcjurek has a good point they did good news bad news with the bad news being for custodians players and the good news being for orc players so the question here is isn't that just good news for everyone because yes. orcs get something that is very cool very fluffy and make orc players very happy and happy orc players are just fun to play against uh, debatable but sure Move. happy Continue. orc players i didn't say toxic orc players there is no such thing as a difference um, and then custodies who we regularly complain about because they're one of the factions that has been overperforming recently are getting a nerf to a side grade probably more of a nerf based on what we've seen so far which is what we've been asking for so that we're not at a point where we're seeing just two factions at 18 percent of the meta which is funny well, because this book would have been written months ago. So this isn't a like, and this it's is something that's probably going to come a lot. Is that little people are like, oh, this is a response to Cassidy's being too bad, too good, and they're being punished. It's like, no, this is whatever happened with regards to the writing of these two codexes. Um, it highlights once again that there are very clearly different camps within the the studio who write these books because one feels phoned in and the other one feels, oh, that's actually pretty cool. You know, it's the Admech and Necron thing again. And yes, Grant, this is the time to pick up some cheap custodies lots. Uh, I don't need anything right now for my custodies, but uh, maybe I'll do, pick do up a couple. Own, do you own your 30 <laughs> Vigilators, Prosecutors, and Witch Seekers? No, and I yeah. never will because I refuse. Actually, no, they're already assembled. I won't have to build them because those models are horrible to put together. I don't know. All I'm really, <laughs> the truth of the matter is, yeah, Ben, if we can get one of us on a codex review for orcs with Innis, I will cash in my Innis needs to be positive about orcs for 24 hours, says Seth the Mad Doc. 
I am I'm actually really going on that. That's funny. No, you're not. We're we're gonna vote for you not being able to say no I'm busy in the back week. chat. Nope, not. <laughs> you're washing your hair every night that week. I'm, That's what you're gonna yeah, say. Man, I got. I got. Uh, <laughs> I'm watching the dog. <laughs> He's I'm going to love expensive. the series Sorry. of excuses. Yeah, right. Here's the problem, Luis. The Custodius block being going to be as amazing as Dark Angels is that Dark Angels can actually just play regular Space Marines if they feel like it. Custodies can't do that. Yeah, they can play Heresy. It's fun. <laughs> I do. I did hear that they're very good in Heresy right now. It's all the same data sheets. Yeah. All the same models. You can't use Virtus Praetors. Aside from that, I, I think everything else I hope Custodies make Admech look like Necrons. Ooh, that's not a nice thing to wish on anybody. Yeah, but Admech are All winning right. events. True. Well, custodies are winning events. Yeah, but I mean after. They might. Look, I'm gonna one custodian gonna... player that's good. Like there's one Admech player that's good. Shout out to Mate. Then I'll live with that. That's fine. I can handle there being one dude. You yeah. just can't hold handle showing up to an event and one in twelve players being custodes. No, I'm so sick of it. Even though they're just free, because all custodies players suck. But <laughs> all right, we're going to transition into the Alpine Cup portion of this, so that Innes can talk about something that's not Orc and or custodies related. I didn't play and, either of those the weekend. It was great. Oh, that's amazing. But yeah, Orc players be excited. Custodies players tremble in fear. Um, Innes, talk to us about the Alpine Cup. Tell us what you brought. Sure. So we're gonna do a very. Uh, Fairly short overview on this one because it was just me that was there. If you want to hear more on this, do check out Enter the Matrix. They should be doing their Alpine Cup full review because obviously Nathan and Typhus are both on the team so that played uh, Alpine Cup in what was uh, the first versus third place match in round four. Uh, I believe Nathan, Typhus, and Pumbaa are going to go through like the pairings matrix and all the pairings and talk through that round and go through it in some proper detail. So if you want to see more on that, go and check that out. It is going to be a fantastic episode, and I'm very much looking forward to looking through myself. We got we did a ton of pairings prep for uh, England because it was the overnight round, and we got out paired like hell, and it was very cool to watch. Um, <laughs> and definitely go and give that a check out. So it'll be super interesting to hear the English perspective on it because obviously I know ours. Give me one second. So, this weekend, we attended the Alpine Cup, which was, as we said, a 73, 72-team, five-player team. So, there was 360-ish players in the room, which is, you know, pretty good. Um, we descended with the winning team from last year. Uh, I, I was playing Sons of Sangonius, playing a very similar list to what I've been playing, except I trimmed uh, a few things to fit in Lancers instead of Ball Predators. So, I had uh, 10 Death Company with Lamartes with Jump Packs, 10 on foot in a Rhino with Chaplin. Uh, I finally got to use his turn off, his, uh, turn -off battle shock ability. That was cool. Um, two squads of five assault intercessors with captains in impulsors. Two squads of five jump pack intercessors. Um, I had two lancers, a squad of scouts, a Calidus assassin, and the Sanguinor. Um, go for it. Why the lancers over the predators? So the main the main concern I had with the ball predators is they're really good at pushing midfield, but I'm not really struggling at pushing midfield with this army. Um, what I needed was some stuff to screen my backfield, make it so I don't have to turn around give me some long range threat because one of the things I found was that I was playing against people with like a couple of tank commanders or execrines or things like that that could just kind of sit on a line, sit on a firing lane and I kind of just couldn't access it without it being like disastrous. Having the Lancers able to sit in my backfield, they have that nice little antenna that pokes over a WC Ruin so they can shoot on some angles that wouldn't otherwise. <laughs> um, <laughs> my, so they that's can, my like, favorite scout, visual cue though. Buildings. Yeah, yeah, that, look, they're arcing their <laughs> shot. The Lancer gun can go upwards. Uh, ignore the fact that it's a laser. I'm sure lasers are. Uh, They're doing that wanted movie thing of bending bullets, yeah. but bending lasers. There's an orbital. There's, a, there's like a space mirror that gets dropped down with the sanguinor <laughs> to like deflect the laser. Um, so yeah, um, they were very solid. I, it very, is just the sorry is the orbital mirror. Yeah, they can be a little uh, a little underwhelming occasionally. Like two shots with a reroll to hit one in damage really sounds like it should be reliable, but you, the number of times I rolled a two into a two, um, it's like even with different dice, it remains. That shouldn't matter, but it feels like it should. Um, it, it's very painful. Um, they actually, yeah, the, the, the fires at the back of the antenna and goes like the other way around the planet. Um, <laughs> and then hits them, and hits them in the back, but they can see where it is. I think that's how that should work. Um, so yeah, round one, we paired into Try Hard Wargaming. They had actually grudged us. I ended up playing into Pierre Alexander Husdale and his uh, Iron Storm Black Templars. He had Sort of the like a five tank build uh, with the triple sword brethren squads with two with two cars one with Hellbrecht. 
Um, kind of an interesting game. They got first board choice here and put us on a board that had like a very open firing line, like directly down the middle of the board from deployment zone to objective to deployment zone objective. There was like a tiny like wafer thin line that I put two lancers on and went, I uh, outranged your one lancer, your three reapers are outranged by this. Good luck. You're going to sit on it. And then he went, no. And I went, cool. So I control the firing lines this game. Yeah. And he went, yes, went, I'm faster than you. And I hit harder than you in combat. And he went, yeah. And I went, okay, cool. Um, so I won that game 15-5. I just kind of like pressured the middle, attacked his home objective for two turns then uh, and then his side objective and kind of just kind of ground the game out. He scored like 39 on secondaries because he had double scouts, double infiltrators. So very difficult to stop him from like just racking up points. But he ended up scoring like 25 primary to my 50. Uh, I think I max scored that game and won. Uh, got it to 15-5. The rest of the round went pretty well. Brian 20 nil something. Oh, Danny Porter's Orcs, um, Anthony 20 nil, Josie Cartwright's um, Necrons Hypercrypt. Uh, that game was going to be somewhere in the region of a 12 8 to a 15 5 until three uh, eight bound, uh, sorry, two regular eight bound and one exotic eight bound killed the monolith from 15 to zero in combat and in, in an ongoing combat, having taken Damn. no damage from the monolith, um, you know, as is about average. Um, and then Typhus and Pumba both got 13s. Uh, Pumba got a 13 with his Death Guard against. Uh, endless sword territories he went first and his cultist punched 10 gargoyles to death or 10 gargoyles to death or something of that equivalent which was quite funny and typhus got a 13 into i'm struggling but i want to say something like guard um i think it was guard he kept his castigators kept battle shocking uh castigan squads in overwatch um because the castigator battle shock ability is not templated the same as anybody else's um so he would battle battleshock in overwatch deny deny sam nash a bunch of primary and then also deny him the reinforcement strategy very funny uh, so we got a solid little round win there. I think that put us somewhere in 10th place. Um, one of the weirder quirks of this event, which I say was weird, it's very much a WTC thing, is that this was just a one place two tournament. Um, so team the team in first place played the team in second place, the team in third played the team in fourth, and so on and forth, so forth down the line. So you almost always knew who you were going to play, unless there was a team sort of like above you that had already played somebody, which happened a couple of times in the later rounds, and we had a little bit of reshuffling for that. But very broadly, if you did well, you played another team that did well. Um, rather than it being wins random. I think with the tournament format being where the point where there could have been as many as three teams on 5-0, and all, it makes sense to just give the team that does the best in the toughest environment the best chance of winning. But it definitely and uh, it didn't end up mattering a ton for like winner of the event, um, but it definitely could have impacted um, outside that. Round two, we paired into Tryhard Nordic, uh, who were another Tryhard team um, based out of, uh, sorry, not Tryhard Nordic, Tryhard Romania, um, who were a team based out of Romania. Um, we... They, they came to us during the pre-game and were like, we would like to score 20 points this round because we had scored 79 against the previous team. They're like, we want to do one better. And I looked at them and went, no, we want to farm you for 100 points. Uh, and then we scored 95. Um, so <laughs> shout out to the try to the try hard North <laughs> Romania guys for being super good about that because uh, we, we we are we kind of so rude. Rude. a little bit. It was it was a little rude. Um, this was supply drop, which is a mission that encourages 20 nils when you have um like a team that's as strong as ours is. Um, Brian put 20 points on to Custodes. Uh, I 20 nilled a Chaos Knights list in one of the most brutal, just like, oh, their army's dead games of my life. My first activation of the game was a Lancer one-shotting a Carnivore, um, which is just like, yeah, it, it's like not even that unlikely, but it just feels bad when it happens. Just I did straight 18 damage to it. Um, and then my Captain one-shot a Carnivore in the middle objective, and my other Lancer did nine damage, and then the mortal wounds on the charge for my assault missiles killed the third one. And that was my turn one, was activating a captain and two Lancers and a charge mortals. Um, you know, normal stuff. That um, was the, the captain the with his once per game or without his once per game? Yeah, the captain game. with his once per game. He was okay. very dead after that. He got charged okay. by a carnivore and a stalker immediately afterwards. <laughs> he, he, he got, they they took bad. that personally then. <laughs> yeah, they were like, Jesus Christ. I don't want to let that guy do that again. Um <laughs> That then rolled into we had Typh uh, Pumba fifteen five into Votan, um, Typhus twenty nil there. Blood Angel Sons of Sanguinius list. Uh, shout out to the missionary that tanked a Lancer, Grenade Strat, an Outrider squad, a Scout squad of shooting, and seven Inferno pistols and shooting and lived on a wound. Um, Without being resurrected, just yeah, it just lived on a wound. Um, <laughs> seven out of seven four ups. The, the emperor really, protects, I guess. The emperor is truly benevolent. He has a holy bull pistol, not even a regular bull pistol. It's true. Uh, and then Anthony twenty nailed something. It's hard to remember. Anthony's games are over pretty fast. Uh, <laughs> that rolled us into Pizza Garage, who was the Italian team who I believe came second last year with Blacklist. Uh, they were the four one one team that we didn't end up playing. 
Um, this was a super tight round. This is the round that we played on stream. So if you're interested in watching that, as Jeremy was talking about it earlier, I'll get Jeremy to talk a bit about the game because uh, he watched it for Typhus. Um, this round ended up being like super tight. We ended up winning this one 60 to 40, uh, where the win threshold was 56 points. Uh, it definitely felt like it came down to um, we had a couple. We had a game that got away from us, uh, which I'll talk about in a second, and then a couple of games that like went for pushes that didn't quite work out, um, and it ended up in some quite interesting scenarios. So the first result of the round that came in was Anthony, who got a twenty nine to Necrons. Uh, he was predicted tracing fracking for about a fourteen, but um, I believe Angron with no abilities up, just plus one to wound, no full hit rerolls, just one shot the Nightbringer in combat after the race like reactive moved away from him. He just charged the Nightbringer, went set, like nine hits, nine wounds, Nightbringer went fail seven, die. Um, which fuck around, find out, I guess. Um, then my game was tracking to be about an 18. I was playing at the Death Guard, um, but because the rest of the round was going pretty badly, I kind of went around and ran the numbers on do we need to go for a push? So I went for what I would describe as the greediest push of my life, where I kind of I had like an 18, like kind of locked up. I could just, you know, score, go and score my overwhelming force, deny him some primary on his home objective, get my like 18 points. But if we needed a 20, I could try and kill six Death Shroud and a Lord of Virulence with, like, the shit in my pockets. Uh, and, like, Death Guard are pretty resilient thing. against the shit in your pockets is the problem. Yeah, so I had um, five Assault Intercessors and a Captain. The Lamartis, the Sanguinor, Lamartis on two wounds, the Sanguinor and Oath of Moment, and no CP. Um, and I had to decide where to about Those resources could only go to the Death Shroud, or I could just leave them alone and just, like, kill Mortarian, who was on, like, five wounds, or kill the stuff on his home objective for overwhelming force. But if I do that, he's going to get, like, the five primary for that bottom right objective. He's going to get the five for his home... He's potentially still going to get the five for his home objective because he can, like, walk up there and roll a charge. Or I can go for the greedy option of trying to kill them. He's holding three CP. He's got an Overwatch and minus one damage available. None of this is feeling great for me. <laughs> but call comes around, and I'm like, I can take 16 if this doesn't work, 20 if it does, or I can take the 18. Literally... What are you trying? Call comes around. It's looking bad. We're tracking for like 55. All right, then. Let's fucking try it. And I killed those fucking death shrouds. <laughs> Got overwatched, lost three, went in, killed them all. Sanguinar comes in, hero play. There's two left in the character. Sanguinar goes, four dev wounds, pick up your death shroud. Character still stood there. Not enough OC to take it off my impulsor. Game is a good. Then I failed to kill Mortarian with garbage. Didn't matter. And then the death company on his home objective, put, he popped the minus one damage. Did low roll on the shooting, didn't quite get there, left it alive, failed to push, he got his home objective, Mortarian falls back, gets the middle, 16. Fair enough. The, I failed the easy part of that, which was killing the Playbrush Crawler. <laughs> <laughs> Playbrush Crawler just needed to die to seven, seven Inferno Pistols and a, seven Inferno Pistols and a charge, but it was not to be. Such is life. Um, but yeah, super interesting game I played against Andrea, he was absolutely wonderful to play against. Um, Brian ended up going down 11 9 to Custodies with uh, two Gladys in this game. Just one of those ones where the shooting output just didn't quite come together. Um, we played Scorched Earth this round. That sounds right. And uh, just like, ne you never quite got the burn off. You just never quite felt like in a position to do it. Uh, Pumba went down, and then Pumba got a 10 10 into their Thousand Sons, uh, which was a bit of an overperformance. We were definitely tracking for like six or seven from that game. That's most of where we recovered the points. They got us back to the winning position. Uh, obviously, Anthony's game blew out a little bit. And then Typhus, in what we thought was a pretty good pairing into Sisters, um, had a couple of things just not quite go his way, where he was, I want to say, like, he was a little bit, like, intimidated, stressed out being on stream. Um, also, at the end of round three, and he was not the most sober person I've ever met, um, given that he had drank seven beers in the previous game. Um, so I think he made, he had a couple of, like, small micro mistakes that in Sisters against Guard just kind of added up. And then when he kind of like locked in for the back sort of a couple of turns of the game, it was just a little bit too late to really recover the points he needed. Um, we were tracking like we needed one point out of his game to, to win the round and he ended up getting four, I want to say. But Jeremy, you could five. Jeremy, you yeah. can talk a little more about Yeah, that. so I, I, I was flipping in and out, but like this game was very interesting to, to watch because we've talked a lot over the last little while about the sisters and guard pairing um, in, the, in the stat check discord uh, because there's two camps of thought about who is favored into that matchup. I am still of the thought that Sisters is favored into that matchup, but you do need to play it very tightly. Um, a lot of guard players just think that it's... In my local, they think that it's, that it's swingy, which I think is true. Um, from the little bit that I did watch, there were like a couple small positioning mistakes that Typhus made 
and he caught them, you know, the usual way that you catch a mistake like that, like a half turn later, you go, shit. <laughs> well, and so there were a lot of moments where it's just like he'd lost a little bit more than he should have at, at some points. He killed a little bit less than he needed to. Uh, and the guard player was just able to, you know, power through all of that. Also, Medusas are just dumb. Like that... <laughs> the carriage battery Medusas. Yes. There were three <laughs> yeah. of them on that guard list. <laughs> That's way funny because why? 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 Because they're 110 points and they're flat three damage and AP three and strength 10. Oh, yeah. They're only D6 shots and they're only ballistic skill five. They're but heavy, aren't they? they are heavy and they're they are they are heavy also they have the regiment keyword and their infantry oh so they can get oh wow that's so much easier to buff them oh yeah oh yeah i like that that's yeah, not only that they also have grenades for some reason well yeah because they're um, infantry because they're infantry men running around with the the rifle and everything <laughs> the carrying the medusa behind them <laughs> yeah uh and james <laughs> did point out the the hero hunter killer shot one though and just <laughs> The the most insulting thing about Medusa is that you can bring them back. There is a um, they have the regiment keyword. Yeah, they they do. Uh, so there is a hilarious uh, moment in WTC where Skark brings back a Medusa carriage battery to score homers in his opponent's deployment zone. That did seem like he was just like t posing on his opponent's yes, corpse. Very though. much so. <laughs> I'm not. He he had other options. Skark he was did. doing it to prove a point. <laughs> yeah, that is the no. You do not mess with Skark. Yeah, um, we messed with Skark. It worked Poland. out not great. We'll get to that in round five. All right, let's keep going. <sighs> round four, between round three and four, I just want to shout out. By the way, um, Leoben is going to be an interesting venue for WTC. There is not a lot open in Leoben after eight PM, which is to say that of the three hundred and fifty players at WTC, I want to say conservatively one hundred and twenty of them were at the same McDonald's. Um, <laughs> were they as warned? <laughs> Were they warned? The McDonald's, no, no. We just showed up. Uh, it <laughs> was need to warn warn them next. It year. was an interesting, uh, interesting set of food choices. Um, there were not a lot of them. That little is going to do business. If your team's going to WC in Leoben in 2025 and 2026 and 2027, if it's there for three years, consider an Airbnb with a with a grill and use one of your five coaches that can't play uh, to go and cook food for you every round. That might be. <laughs> <sighs> Christ. Uh, All right, it was Nick, very... I hope you know how to use a, 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 a small grill. <laughs> um, so yeah, Typhus proceeded to eat 35 chicken nuggets. What a hero. Love him. Uh, he was the, apparently he apparently. was trying to prevent the hangover. Uh, apparently. Um, <laughs> then we rolled into game four, which was against England Lions. This was in Vital Ground and Hammer and Anvil. Um, if you've not seen the Alpine maps, there is a there was a couple of boards where you uh, can't physically move like vehicles just like at all. And a couple of boards that might as well just say we don't have terrain on them. Um, so unfortunately, uh, England managed to get the first defender roll and managed to keep us away from putting their Iron Storm or Land Raider list on the no terrain board. So we ended up having uh, Brian on Thousand Suns playing into Manny's Eldar. That ended up finishing as an 11-9 with a small win. Brian went for a push because we were looking down. It didn't quite work. We got an 11. Uh, we were tracking for like a 13 or a 14, but such is the Eldar matchup. You try to push too hard. Eldar are very good at repelling you. It's also just generally hard to score really high into Eldar because he just played fixed and just played assassination uh, or, um, behind the lines to put double homers for seven points a turn with a unit because Eldar are balanced. Um... We then had myself into Nathan on uh, Land Raider and Five Dread Knights. Um, this game mostly came down to like Nathan playing it very well, but staying like just enough far inside my threat range that I had to roll like marginally risky charges and then failing a very important four inch charge, costing me a CP, which just resulted in like kind of a cascade. That Grey Knight list is very good at if you try to kill something and you fail it punishes you re really, really hard for it. A Land Raider that's tagged in combat doesn't care. A Dread Knight that's tagged in combat falls back, shoots and charges, doesn't care. Um, and then the rest of the list is, well, it's the, the list is those eight models, so there's not really anything else outside that. Um, so I went for a push turn on my turn three, uh, my turn two after a Rapid Ingress, and um, just left, like, two things alive on slightly too many wounds, and then got like cascaded on because those things then took too much damage back didn't kill the next thing and then that just kind of slipped away uh which resulted in that game going from uh, nathan's prediction at the end of my turn two being a three to nathan winning 13 7 unfortunately um with almost the entire difference being the 16 on primary he got on turn five um which was really rough 
Um, shout out to the Lancers for having their worst game of all time. Six shot, six activations, zero damage um, across turns two, three, and four. Or sorry, uh, eight damage on turns two, three, and four. Ow. Big pain. Um, just rolling twos to wound, bro. Uh, love it. Love and life. Um, the rest of that round, we had Anthony, who got a seven into uh, Alex Harrison's Iron Storm. Uh, we made a board choice there. Uh, we ended up picking a board where Angron didn't really have enough options to move because we kind of went with the idea of it'll constrict Alex, but Alex didn't really care quite as much as Angron did, and it resulted in Anthony basically playing the game with 12 8 bound and like Corn Berserkers, which just isn't enough into an Iron Storm army. Um, he managed to get his Angron back and like swung a bunch of points back, but just not quite enough. Um, the board also didn't have good Homer's options. It was one of the it's, it wasn't like Super L's, but it kind of felt like Super L's if anybody's played on those for WC boards. Um, and he didn't have like good homers options to, from safety. So trying to play fix into there just didn't quite work out. Um, definitely a mistake that we would have fixed if we had kind of considered that a little bit, but it looked like it should have been good on paper. And we just kind of never challenged the assumption as a team, um, which was definitely a mistake. Uh, we then had Nathan, uh, sorry, Pumba playing into uh, Nassim's uh, guard. That game ended... 10 ish, I want to say like a nine or a 10. It was a 10 10. Yeah, 10 10. Just Death Guard stood there and got shot by guard, and it was fine. They're really good at getting shot by guard and not quite dying. Um, and then, uh, unfortunately, the like the big, like not error, but the thing that was a consequence of the, our pairing strategy was that we put Typhus directly into uh, the worst matchup that possibly exists for sisters, which is No Katan Necrons Canoptic Core on a board that had like touching mid ward ruins. Um, this was rough. Typhus got two points because he sat on his objectives. It's vital ground. You're just not scoring primary against a Canoptic Core army that sat in the midfield. Uh, he ended up playing fixed, scraping as many points as he could. But the idea was that between myself and Anthony, we would recover the points from this game, and it just didn't quite come together. Um, it was really unfortunate. We were reasonably close to a draw if either mine or Anthony's games had gone well, and if both of them had gone well, we were on for like maybe a small win. Um, but it just unfortunately on the day didn't come together. Uh, England paired it really well. They definitely knew their win condition was getting... Uh, Alex and Nathan away from that really heavy table and they managed to get their first defender uh, Brian onto it because they won the roll off and keeping Nath, uh, Josh away from myself, Anthony and Brian. So they paired with something that would pull Brian out um, and then we attack, we defended with one of us to try and catch Josh. If he didn't defend, they were they, they caught that. Josh defended. Josh managed to pull out the sisters match up. Um, so yeah, very well played by England. They ended up going on to win the tournament. They played against brilliance in the last round which i believe yeah. is the swiss team um so yes. shout out to the swiss team for making it to the finals um i think they a little bit battered the swiss team i think it was a 5-0 um but yeah so definitely felt like the finals mm -hmm. it was good to good to pass the torch on but we will hopefully batter the shit out of them next year um last round we played poland uh this was the team that we played in the finals last year as well so we played them in round five they had taken a draw against no name which is a uh, liam vsl uh hugo and hugo uh ricardi and um Guillaume from Team Belgium, uh, their team. Um, they drew them, so we played that one. We had Vladi on Grey Knights played into Typhus on Sisters. Typhus ended up getting a 10-10 in this game, which was definitely not what we expected. Um, that was probably tracking to be a slightly small loss. I believe Typhus did some standard Typhus things and like one shot a Dread Knight two turns in a row with a single exorcist. Uh, yeah, Typhus got a 12, by the way. Typhus got a 12 in that game. Apologies. Then we had um we had Brian on his Thousand Sons into RX World Eaters. RX World Eaters. RX had just played Liam. Um, so, so he was a little battered. Brian uh, and then played Brian and got 18. Um, shout out to this game was Angron coming back, back on back to back turns. Came home, came, came home to play on turn two and three. Um, and still got 18. Still got 18. Yep. Two Angrons still got 18. We had Anthony on his World Eaters played into. Kruker on Sisters. Uh, this game ended up being a 12-8 to us. Um, basically, standard um, standard stuff. Or, or this this was the score chart game. Apologies. Um, he shoved forward with uh, shoved forward with Angron. Angron got onto the guy's home objective and took that point off him. Angron took no damage this game. Anthony ended up with like a Rhino and Angron alive and slightly ahead against the Sisters army that wasn't on objectives for the first three turns. Um, so well done to Anthony there. Pumba played into Skark. This was the last game to finish. We knew we needed a point out of his game to win the round. So he kind of carried up his score at the end of four and just call it because um, we were far enough ahead. We didn't need the tiebreaker points. He, did, he was on four. So he didn't play his last turn, but this game ended up as a 16-4. Um, I don't actually know what the conditions of this one go where it went so much messier than the last game. I would definitely need to ask that one, but uh, that's a question to ask Pumba if you see him. Uh, and then my game, I played into Zozo on Necrons. Zozo had a 
monolith triple katan um and then like a warrior brick and an immortal brick uh he went first kind of staged up shot his monolith at my rhino did like four damage to it and then just kind of sat behind some walls i kind of responded the same i like walked the two lancers onto the line to see the monolith chipped like nine damage onto it he very briefly went oh that's not good i don't like the amount of damage that monolith just took and went super aggressive with it um he like wrapped one of my impulses with his fire and fading immortals and then the lancers picked up the monolith because he didn't have the cv to protect it with the invulnerable save while holding like an interrupt or anything like that um and then i proceeded to just like gank a bunch of katan um the death company like on foot plus the sort of just killed the void dragon i put the like the other one down to seven killed the monolith killed the immortals uh left him with like on like a warrior squad a transcendent katana and the nightbringer on like five wounds to play the game with nightbringer fell back from me which was a fun experience i enjoyed that one um and the monolith the warriors teleport to my home objective i cleared them out with the jump death company and then just kind of controlled the game from there for a 13-7 um shout out to saras for being terrifying and me having no answer to deal with him once he was teleporting about uh, and for the, <laughs> the nightbringer for actually living the game after getting charged on turn two by a squad of death company then getting recharged yeah. by that same squad of death company two turns later um like i went up like from my midfield to the top of the top objective charged the nightbringer like fell back from him after taking like, like losing one guy to more wounds charged 20 necron warriors on my home objective uh then charged back moved back up charged something else um then charged the nightbringer again then the nightbringer fell back from me and we ended the game <laughs> it was like i charged the nightbringer <laughs> four separate times that game and he left all one wound what a hero um i want to say that round ended up with something like us in the mid 60s uh i don't remember off the top of my head unfortunately um but that did put us into third place as we were the top four and one team second place went to no name which again was liam vsl's team so he managed to win the singles and come second in the team event shout, shout out to liam for being the best player in the world and first place went to Team England Lions, to the great sadness of the other 320 people in the room. <laughs> but we did win in the end because we paid Nas, uh, Typhus in the end paid Nas money to shave mutton chops into his face, which he has to wear for two weeks. So if you see Nas at uh, the Oxford GT, he will be wearing mutton chops. Uh, it's glorious. His work made fun of him for it. Love you, Nas. You're wonderful. <laughs> That, that event sounds amazing. That's all I'll say. It that's was just one. I, I love playing with the uh, with the um, with the, that group of guys. Between that and Euro Trash and Last Alpine and all the good stuff, it's just so much fun to be able to descend on an international team event with a, a team from a bunch of different countries that aren't like close to each other, right? You could understand if it's like a team of you know French and Belgians or something like that, but the fact that it's Poles, Americans, and a Scotsman, just it's it's fantastic to me. And then we had obviously the Euro Trash team, which had um, the Amer more Americans and a New Zealand player on it. Uh, we've also got Boris, who is Bulgarian, in the group. So it's super awesome. Um, I, I love that group of guys. It's wonderful. Also, the only solution I've heard for Cesaras is to play first company, apparently, and you can battle shot kill him, I guess, with one of the with Fear Made Manifest. Because <laughs> if he fails it, you can just Thanos snap him out of existence because he is a mo an infantry model. So he just that Thanos. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So that's that's the only solution I have. This is the rest. <laughs> I like how it also caused Jeremy physical pain. <laughs> no, I'll show you one thing as well. Crooker was running Eisenhorn in a Sisters of Battle squad to give him Miracle Dice. That, let's go. That guy's gun is terrifying with Miracle Dice. It's uh, <laughs> two shots at five, two, three with dev wounds precision uh, and oh. sustained hits one. And it's just like, oh, what if your character just died? Just went away. Yeah. Just dust on the wind. Why don't we talk about? We talked about. We're going to talk about balance days late, but I think we should move on to questions because we are an hour and twenty minutes into the show. Why don't you do the plugs then, Ines? Because oh, then you're well, going to do them I've again in twelve minutes. I've lost my bit of paper. <laughs> you're going to have to give me a second. Provide right. for a bit. Um. So this that funny thing though was brought up to me by a local. He's like, Nathan, does this work? And I was like, I guess. <laughs> um. But yeah, fear made manifest. It's an enhancement. You can force a battle shock test with anything, and then says the rest just disappears. Hell yeah. Um. Yeah, Coral. He was using it with fire and deck. It was in a rhino. Yeah. Other than that, I don't know. Some of our we don't have a we have a some long questions this week that we'll be going through, but not a ton of questions. Cool. I need to, I I'm going to need to write out the things I need to mention. Here. All right. Uh, thank you to Tim Penny for the $20 for the wah. And that's the best I'm going to do without scaring everybody in my apartment. Um, and then thank you to Daniel Paulini for the hip, hip, her storm Raven. A 
wow, I actually cannot believe that I was able to say that. <laughs> Dang, Ines, are you writing like a whole novella over there? I'm writing the notes. Fuck you. you do it. <laughs> um, also, we are working on some more stat stuff, and I guess I can get, but I can also give you a preview of something fun instead. I don't know if we actually previewed this or not. So I'm going to preview some merch stuff because everybody always asks for it. And it's about mm. time now to preview some merch stuff. So okay, I'm going to share, I'm going to share my yeah. screen again, and we're going to share just a tiny bit of a screenshot for a piece of merch. Just show the full picture. It's fine. God. Damn it. Now I gotta go find the full picture in S. <laughs> <laughs> well, I shared that like two weeks ago in the in the in the um the super tier patrons. So yeah, that's why they got it. That's this exactly. was for the general public in S. Show it to everybody now. I mean they could figure Fine. out what was coming. Give me, give me a out. minute. Give me a minute while I pull up the actual jersey. Jesus. We are in I want to say the final stages of getting the designs confirmed, so we should hopefully have this within a couple of weeks. Going yep. I'm going to share an entire window because this sounds like way more fun to me for some reason. Here you go. You can see my whole window for a moment and my massive number of Discord channels that I'm in. <laughs> that is a lot of Discord. You, have you heard of folders, Nathan? Uh, I have two folders full of channels that I don't use anymore because I didn't want to leave the channel, but I'm still in them. Are we allowed to be upset that StatCheck's not at the top? Um, it's, I haven't organized it recently. Statistics usually at the top, um, but it's been a while. I guess I can show some more merch previews. I'll pull up some more yeah, merch do that. stuff. Do that. I've written my list down now, but this is more fun. All right. And then here is another piece of merch that you all can purchase if you want. You'll probably see well, us at some yeah, stuff. But soon. soon. You'll be able to purchase them soon. Here's a, a hoodie that we also are going to have. That's a nice little gears pattern that's on everything. And then on the jerseys, you'll be able to put your name on the back is one of the customization features that you can get. Nice. And then fine. One last thing. We'll preview just some. And probably go, random... oh, yes, they do come. They, look, man, they come in my abs. sizes. They do. They come in all sorts of sizes. This, this then... is this basic night jackets from the same company. And this is a 5XL. And it fits me very well. <laughs> here's here's one last thing that you can see. We have a bunch of other merch that's coming, uh, including a shirt. Oh, I guess there are little arrows at the corner. A beanie. Arrows. A backpack, which was specifically chosen for a friend of the show, David Gaylord. Um, a not as fancy hoodie, in case you want a hoodie that is a little bit nicer. A mug, which actually I kind of want now. <laughs> a polo, so when you're at work, you can look nice and rep stat check. We don't need a mug. Um, we already have you. A t-shirt. I know. And the beanie again, and the backpack Why again, is and the hoodie again. There's the pants, and then a pair of sweatpants. <laughs> Wonderful. It, Anthony oh, yeah. told me after we put I put that in the back chat that he is now officially just never going to leave stat check clothes ever again. Which sure, I probably. will never not be amused by. Yeah. So anyway, soon TM. It'll be it'll be with us as soon as we can make it available. Um, right. Plugs. Thank you so much, everybody, for being with us so far for episode 86 of Stat Check. This has been Wishing Upon a Balance Mass so far. We're going to come back with show questions just after these messages, so please do stick around and don't uh, judge me too harshly. There are a bunch of things you can do to support us if you're in a position to. The first one is all of the standard social media shit, so YouTube, liking, comment, subscribing, all the, you know, the usual things that people ask you to do, but unfortunately does actually make people do it more, so you have to say it. It really bugs me as well. Sorry. Ring that you bell. You can also leave a review on any of the various podcast aggregators, whether that's Spotify, iTunes, or I assume there are more, but who really knows? Uh, I use Spotify for everything nowadays because leaving my little bubble of things I use all the time it scares me. Um, if you're in a position to, oh, we would love it if you could check out patreon.com slash statcheck for $5 a month or your regional equivalent. You can support our show as well as get access to our wonderful, wonderful Patreon community where you can chat about all things Warhammer, all things not Warhammer, frequently more than things Warhammer. You can take part in the Vibe Checks League, which are our running TDS leagues, which is currently coming up for the end of the fourth round in a couple of days, uh, which I believe Alex Sacco is currently smashing. So, you know, if you want to play against some of the best players in the world, you can show up and play <laughs> against, you know, Alex Sacco in a random TDS league. We do strongly recommend um if you're in a position to support our sponsors as well we, we are static is brought to you by three main companies we have will and yutani who are the wc train provider who will uh, they also provide all the train traveling cups so if you saw any of that on the streams and you want to check that out you can check out whalen yutani inc i want to say but there's a link in the description don't trust me i know nothing about any of this 
You can also use our code StatCheck5 for 5% off uh, or Stat5. Stat5? It's in the description. It's in the description. There's a code in the description that'll get you 5% off at the point of purchase <laughs> as well. Please do check that out. You can check out Saltar Games on Etsy. There's a code in the description for that as well. I'm pretty sure it's whatever the whatever the other code was, but with 15 instead of 5, because guess what? It's a 15% discount. You can get access to things like widgets and measuring gauges and tokens for Battle Shocks, Ultimo, and all that good stuff available at Saltar Games on Etsy. Lastly, you can check out our primary sponsor, who is red-dragon.ca. That's definitely in the description, but I know that one by heart because we say it a bunch, and it's on the link I click at the beginning of the video. If you're a Patreon member, you can also get access to a 20% discount code to Red Dragon through your Patreon membership. Jeremy, don't make fingers, don't make fingers at me if you don't want me, if you don't want to stop. It will confuse me. I am running purely on fumes here. Uh, <laughs> If you're interested in getting any of your various board games, Magic the Gathering, um, Warhammer, mostly Warhammer. I would recommend Warhammer. They have tons of Warhammer. Do check out red-dragon.ca. They are your friendly looking gaming store in Ottawa. Uh, but also, if they will ship internationally, they will sort you out. Dan is an amazing help with any of that. I think Jeremy's helping out with them now as well. Ridiculous conflict of interest. No? Not at the moment? You're just playing games there? That's fine. It's not We do have a separate production team, but that's... That's fine. Look, man, everything that we do is like a separate thing at this point. I wear we six hats and half of them are like half on at any given point. Nobody so. has ever known what's going on with StatCheck. That's a very good statement. <laughs> lastly, well, second to lastly, you can check out all the various other shows on the network. Mm -hmm. That is X and One who are currently on hiatus. End of the Matrix, so we're doing their Alpine Cup pre post show, having just done their Alpine Cup pre show. That is available usually Thursdays, but uh, it really depends on availability. I would imagine next week that will be the show. Um, so check back for that on the 18th of April. Take All Comers is usually every Saturday. That's the show done by Kylas, Luca, and Noj, Lucas and Noj, where they go through all of the various things that are their most recent tournaments about being, you know, really good and trying to, you know, become top level cutting edge. Lucas is in the final rounds of selection for Team USA right now. Uh, I expect we expect to be seeing that in the next couple of weeks. So if you want to hear from some of the best players on the planet playing out at the Pacific Northwest, do check them out. Lastly, Champions of 40K is our newest show produced by the wonderful, wonderful Steve Joel, who you will have heard on our last episode. Their most recent episode, Jeremy and Nathan, you'll know this more than me. It was Seth the Mad Doc, I believe, was the most Seth recent Seth the Mad Doc from Frontline Gaming, but now from Signals from the Frontline, which is not technically the same thing anymore, um, but still. It's the same crew. I'm you should sure go that. like and subscribe to their YouTube channel. You should channel go and like though. and subscribe to the Signals from the Frontline on YouTube. If you want to hear about all of the people who are, well, many of the people who are changing Warhammer for the better in all walks of that, whether it's competitive or in content or in background stuff, Champions of 40k is going to be bringing to you the stories of all those kinds of people from the wonderful, wonderful, truly incredible mind of Steve Joel. Lastly, if you're interested in improving your own personal 40k game and you'd like to hear from either myself, Jeremy, or Typhus about growing as a player, whether you've got a tournament coming up, you just want to figure out what the best list in the new Orcs or Custodes Codex is, or you just want to beat up your friends at your local store a little bit better, check out patreon.com, nope, stat-check.com slash coaching, or drop us an email at coaching at stat-check.com, and we'd be more than happy to help you out. Just drop the coach that you're looking to speak to and any information that you can into your email or onto the website and drop us a message, or drop one of us on the Discord. We can always connect you with someone else. Otherwise, thanks so much, everybody, for being here so far. We're going to go into the show questions now. As always, if you want to get your question answered, you can guarantee get it answered by either being a member of the Patreon and asking it in the statute Discord, as long as the question is not completely shit. And even if it is completely shit, we'll probably answer it. Or you can drop us a super chat in the YouTube right now if you're just looking to get a one-off question, and we will make sure that we get to it. Otherwise, ask something super interesting, and we'll start, and we'll get back to it if we have time. But the main thing is, thank you so much, everybody, for being with us so far. Thank you for bearing with that every week, because they keep making me do it. They won't let me leave. <laughs> Let's move on. True. I'm going to stop for two seconds and have a drink of water before I kill myself. All right. We have main show questions from the Discord first, and then we'll go into YouTube chats. We already talked about the Super Chats. They weren't questions, so um, that's just that. Um, if Super Chats come in that are about questions, I guess we'll do those at the end. First set is from Alistair Taylor. Uh, this is a three-part question. The first part is a preamble. You don't want to do this one? We're not going to do it? Innis, you're muted. I know. Two asks three part questions. <laughs> Alistair Taylor does one of our Patreons. I have trouble re re with remembering line of sight and terrain rules, obscuring, etc., for shooting, and seem to get misled by experts, intentionally or otherwise, when playing. Does anyone have slash can make a MS paint flow chart or something similar that I can take with me so my ADHD doesn't cripple my games? Rules Hammer on Goonhammer has one. Uh... There you go. 
check it out. Um, just search rule, Rules Hammer, Goon Hammer, and then like obscure like terrain for 10th edition. You should be able to find it pretty easily. They have diagrams and everything from uh, Break Eye. Uh, they're all pretty on point. The second question is, being my first tournament, any tips for ensuring I don't ruin other players' day by way of my own inexperience slash ignorance? Um, be open to them telling you that something is, you know, gone wrong and, like, work with them to fix it. The more communicative you are, the better, uh, which is something that can be definitely difficult. But um, bring, you know, your dice, your tape measure, bring, make sure your phone is charged and you have, like, the app downloaded and your list built in it, ideally, so you can check your rules pretty quickly. Um, be, like, comfortable with asking your opponent their rules and just get used to it. You will do it a lot at every level of 40k that you play. So getting used to it early is super beneficial. Um, I would recommend bringing like some tokens that are, even if they're just like bits of paper that you've written down like your buffs on. So anything that's like a command phase ability, like a plus one to hit from a tech marine or something similar, just bring down something to jot it down with so that you have like a visual reminder to remember it. Um, bring your like tactical cards is probably the other thing. And then yeah, dice tape measure. Outside of that, you shouldn't really need anything. If you're playing a combat army, I would recommend having like a three inch combat widget um, with like a one inch, two inch, three inch side. Um, and you'll probably not go far wrong past that. I don't I will think there's half an inch anymore this edition. Can't think of anyone no, that has that. Not so. really, which is nice. Uh, I will add one other thing. Don't be afraid to tell your opponent that you're newer. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. And be like, hey, patience with me. This is my army. I'm pretty sure I know it. But if you feel like there's anything wrong, just, just call me on it. Yeah, um, you can also, like, if you're worried about it, have the, like, time discussion where, hey, if the game, like, I would appreciate if we took the game a bit slower. If you're, like, clearly ahead and it looks like we're not going to finish, I'm happy to give you the win. Like, but have, don't have the conversation at the start, but have it, like, if it, your opponent starts getting agitated over time and you're, like, in a losing position, it'll definitely calm them down and definitely, definitely get people more in a position to be able to, like, talk through the game with you and make sure that you're, like, understanding everything rather than it being, like, because that's one of the things that tend, obviously they are opposition when they're playing you, but you can play the game together despite that. Um, I, if you're newer, would, then that's definitely the thing you can consider doing. Don't feel like you have to, especially if you're winning, but try to make sure you're finishing a game if, in a situation where you should be winning it. Don't win because you timed out because your opponent was helping you. That's not fair. And then it's good to remember that 40K is a collaborative competitive experience. So you are trying to have a good time with your opponent and no perfect game of 40K has ever been played. And all of the best games of 40K have been played in such a way where you and your opponent helped each other make sure that the best game of 40k was played it's not strictly true there's probably been at least one game where someone's conceded off like the first die roll going super well right like your, your storm <laughs> raven gets one shot by a lancer on the first activation of the game explodes and kills all your tech marines like i think i you could call that a perfectly played game of war i have watched that happen so yeah, yeah. there have been perfect games of war play they're just super stupid games that nobody I, if i remember about. correctly it was a scouting wraith knight that explode that caused another knight to explode that then yeah. fell backwards and blew up the rest of the army so Perfect. Cool. That's exactly the, the, the perfect <laughs> Warhammer game, exactly, as we said. This, this next question is going to take me a second to read. It's from Bobby, the RPG Luminary, in our Discord. Hey. Good evening, gentlemen. I've been playing tournament level 40k for several years. In my time, I have seen several things. I'd hope so. At a GT I went to once, I saw a gentleman in a luchador mask. He actually did pretty well. The one time I went to LBO, I came, I, LBO? I came across the guy who was showing his team spirit by wearing a Speedo with a state flag on it. Pretty sure that Not was sure LBO. how well that... I think so. Not sure how well that guy did. There's even an event that gives away championship title belts to its winners. There are several that do that, I believe. Let's Don't go get me wrong. Open. That's cool as hell. Anyways, I guess the question I have is what are your thoughts on pageantry, bravado, and generally over-the-top characters at 40k events? And once the craze, what's the craziest thing you've ever come across at a 40k event along those lines? Again, thank you for all you do. Okay, I will answer both of these at the same time. I think that it's very cool and it's very fun up until the point that the other person doesn't have the patience for it. And so recognizing that moment, if you are someone who likes to be a character and be a little goofy and be over the top, that's all well and fine until the person on the other side of the table says, man, I need you to chill. I can't focus or I can't play right now if you're doing this. This is all coming out of that very silly... Uh, get good 40k meme post about someone shadow boxing when they're playing world leaders during their opponent's movement phase there is an element of like as you actually said with the previous question it's a collaborative game and so if you are doing something that your opponent is finding unsettling and they ask you to stop and they say that it's unsettling you should stop mm -hmm. however 
we also should learn to be a little chill and you know if, someone, if your opponent decides to shadow box during your movement phase be like all right whatever yeah ultimately I, like the only thing worse than an orc player shouting wah is the guy I once played against wearing an, Ah an Ahago t-shirt and I could have lived without ever seeing that. So uh, yeah. <laughs> I want to realize that guy anybody I've ever seen cosplaying uh, or, you know, uh, other than, like, you know, if you see Nazi cosplayers at your tournament, you're allowed to tell them to leave. You don't have to tell them to chill out. Um, yeah. Spain, we're talking to you. Yeah. Uh, I am like at the Adepticon teams, you see people who are, are, you see a lot of people who are dressed up. There's a whole team of people dressed up as orcs, complete with face paint, covering their entire bodies in green speedos, basically, to make themselves green. That was pretty cool. But on the same page as Jeremy, so in D&D, there are a lot of people who play gag characters, but doing that and doing all this pageantry stuff requires buy-in from your opponent. And you can, if you're ruining, you can ruin somebody else's opponent by, like, not giving them any say in what you're doing, basically, since you're playing something that is ostensibly a collaborative experience. So if you're going to do these things, understand that your opponent may not want to buy in and you don't have the right to ruin somebody else's experience to have a better experience for yourself. Also, you better be playing a shit army. If you're beating me and doing that, I'm just going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Like, Admet players are allowed to interact however so, they want. The second a Necron player tries it, we're done. The craziest thing that I've seen, and I, I will just add this in there, Ninth edition Tyranids Codex, someone was playing Tyrannocyte spam and they hid of uh, a 50 mil <laughs> bottle of booze in each tyrannocyte <laughs> and you got the tyrannus you got the booze if you killed the tyrannocyte did we play the same person with eggplant dice because no, i played somebody so this was this was one i was <laughs> okay i because i played against somebody who had like eight terax the terax termite drills and inside each one of them was one of those bottles and every time that you killed one you got the bottle inside it's definitely a possibility yeah so things like and that, it, they're fun, they're entertaining, but it's also just like, if your opponent doesn't drink, you don't be like, no, you have to take this. You'd be like, oh, okay, cool. I'll you know give it to one of your buddies who's at the event who does drink. The next question is from Officer Ben of the Vegas 501st, also known as Ben McJurek, <laughs> uh, which is, what's your go-to Starbucks order? Yes. And I want to answer this by saying none, because Starbucks is an anti-union company and you shouldn't drink there. I'm watching you. Or oh. I did drink their uh, mocha because it's basically all I drink. That's fair. All right. The next question is from that one guy, John, which is, hey, team, 49% win rate, perfectly balanced GSE questions here. With Custodies now being the second book to have only four detachments, how many of the remaining books do you think will have four detachments? And GSE will it be will GSE? Have three for some reason. It'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> we, see, this is the funny thing <laughs> is, you know, so Advec and Necrons came out. And you're like, oh, they had five. Okay, that's that seems low. Marines had seven. Tyranids had six, right? Or Tyranids had five. Tyranids had six, but it feels like four because Invasion Fleet and uh, Synaptic Nexus are the same detachment, and the uh, Crusher doesn't exist. True, but anyways, but they did have six. They they may not all have been good, but they did have six. Whereas then you look at Admech Nexus, they each had five, and you go, uh, and we're like, okay, that's a little low. And then and then Tau has four, one of which is Crew, and you go, hmm. Five. And now custodes are and now custodes have four, and you kind of go, but then orcs have six, so it's it's wildly I mean, inconsistent. I, I orcs, think it's fine. It's basically how many good ideas do they have, and then sometimes it's stretched past that with fucking anvil. But <laughs> no, no, no. First company. First company is at least has cool ideas. Anvil is just terrible. Fair. Um, anvil would be the best attachment in guard, though. So. It's going to be really funny when, like, Imperial Knights have five detachments more than Custodes. It's going to be really funny when that happens. <laughs> It'll be funny They're... when Imperial Knights have more detachments than they do data sheets. Oh, that would be a lot, though. That's actually a lot. They have a lot of data sheets. Uh, isn't it just six? Forge World data sheets, right? I guess we don't count them. <laughs> fine, fine. we're going to ignore the... We're In the book. The data sheets. In the book, okay, fair. Uh, Imperial Knights have more than five data sheets because they have the five big knight variants... <laughs> The two yeah, because they uh, have seven the variants. The so two seven detachments. Variants, like Venus Rex. <laughs> seven detachments will be funny. They'll have Detail. eleven I'm... detachments. There we go. That would be great. We're gonna watch Eldari have eight detachments because they get to. Be and every special. single one's gonna have Phantasm in its pre-nerf status until yes. they FAQ it and the balance data slate six months down the line. All right, now we're Except gonna get battle, to which the... will contain the other data, which will contain the version from the old data slate. 
There are two more questions to this question, so we're going to keep going. Will the low play rate of GS with the low play rate of GSC? Do you think in the additional attachments will bring more players in? No. Yes, if they're interesting. But if the problem is the, the biggest issue with GSC is they're an expensive army to collect, and their models aren't particularly interesting. They're really nice sculpts, actually. Though they're nice sculpts, but like they're a lot of paint. They're a lot of model per model. It's true. They don't have a good. They don't have a really good centerpiece model. Like the, the patriarch, patriarch is. Count. Okay. Patriarch is whatever. It's a, just a brood lord, man. Um, the Jeans are called like infantry models have a real big case of way too much stuff on them for set for five point models as well. Those models mm -hmm. are complicated and don't contrast super easy. Um, which doesn't uh, matter. I don't know. Francois was painted like 60 in the last two weeks with speed paint. Francois so. is an aberration that shouldn't count. Uh, <laughs> you could say he's an aberrant. He is. You can say whatever you aberrant. want. Jeremy. I did not say that. <laughs> More like um, an abominant, but that's okay. Francois does not have three attacks. Let's be real. <laughs> All right. And then the third question is, in general, what style detachment will bring in new players without being broken for top players? Muscle Beach again? No, Muscle Beach should be broken. Let's go. Not in the <laughs> current game. Depends how good it is. Fair. <laughs> and then Ben comes back with a question we can actually answer, which is, what is your preferred sauce on chicken wings? Uh, dry rub usually. I don't mm. like saucy. I don't. I don't really like saucy wings. No, I, I'm more of like a minimal amount of wing sauce in the wings. I can go for like, like a Nando's medium. I'll take that. But barbecue is fine. I'm a big fan of like all these Korean fried chicken like sauce flavors that you can get. There's like a ton of them. The, all the gochujang ones are really nice. But if I had to pick a basic chicken wing sauce, it would be buffalo. Did you start uh, singing the chicken wings? Honey garlic, song? nice and simple. No, just gochujang. <laughs> I, I love the name. I love that's the sound of that word. And gochujang is also just delicious. I mean, it's because it sounds like Gucci gang, let's be real. <laughs> <laughs> and then Dan F says, well, Admech Gucci B tier. Gang. I assume this is from the Art of War. don't lie. Episode. Yes. Yeah. Um, if, I, I talked about it a little bit earlier in the show, but uh, I was on Art of War Down Under with Adam Camilleri this week. Uh, we did an updated stats ladder, faction ladder. Um, where we ranked the the 26 factions that are in the game right now uh, from A, B, C, or D tier, with the exception of Death Watch, who I created the F tier for, because press F for respects for that detach for that army, because it just isn't real. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, and I put... Next time we're on a show without Jeremy, we're going to review his tier list like we did the old Art of War ones. We <laughs> should, right? actually. We uh, should. By the way, someone has... A, a, who's off the show, like, it's, it's, it's purely audio, but someone in my local Discord did create the actual tier list so i can give that to you and you can go you know make fun of it but it was I, stats based more disappointed than you, Jeremy. and it was ranked entirely based on games with uh win rates t whip over rep and uh what was the last one uh also uh performance within each of the elo brackets so looking mm. at the top 10 percent, looking at the next 40 look at the bottom 50 made up stats fake fake news ridiculous ad mech outside of <laughs> G tier is an insult to That's, everybody. Who they have won three players. events, which is three events more than Tyranids have won. Exactly. Tyranids are in G as well, then. All right. Next next question is from Adam Thylacine. Hey there, legends. One, can you please shout out now official Warhammer hero and local Tasmanian community building legend James John Stewart, who is an excellent human being? James John Stewart, you're an excellent human being, both officially and unofficially through us. Here, here. James John Stewart, you are the Tasmanian opposite of the devil. There you go. That's best I got. The Tasmanian and angel, apparently. There you go. I wasn't going to um, go that far, but Tasmanian okay. hero. If he's a Warhammer hero, he's probably an angel. Those guys are all really cool. The Tasmanian saint. There you go. There's your new nickname. <laughs> I don't think you get who? to decide that. I do. No. Uh, who is the, the most saint of the Church of Nathan? There you go. Who is the most loved to hate faction? Tau, Custodes, Eldar? Or does it depend on who is strong right now? Culturally. It's Eldar, it's Eldar and it's not close. Fuck that army. I was gonna say it's actually Tau and it's not close. I'm, I'm gonna not say gonna... I'm gonna I'm gonna side with Nathan here. It is Tau and it's not close. Uh <laughs> I think people go people I, kind I, of go over the I'm assuming that's Kyle Grundy on the Pure Tide program channel. <laughs> it is a hundred percent Tau. Can when I give... first I joined say, 40k though. in this, I almost got bullied out of the hobby. By people who hated Tau so much. Yeah. Every game oh, I played, somebody no, said, no. "Oh, Tau, fuck those guys." Every single game. The Tau commute, the Tau like 
meme got to the point where it was like mean spirited and there's more pushback on it now that if people come into a chat and like oh fuck tau they get pushback whereas you come into a chat and you're like i hate eldar everybody's just like yeah man of course you do <laughs> yeah but i don't think that's a love to hate i think that's right especially right now and historically whenever eldar are in the crosshairs of the community it's because they're broken whereas tau will exactly. be in the crosshairs regardless of whether they're broken or not exactly but that's because yeah. people are idiots and they should hate broken things not gundams <laughs> sure but like that's it's a meme that's turned into like a reality i think for some people a little bit but i like i said i think people get pushed back for being like oh yeah fuck tire now so yeah actually uh, i do hate drones and true tetras tetras need to go die in a fire tetras aren't a real data sheet and you can't make me believe you the next one is there is a chill casual meme list event this weekend what are you bringing three fire rampagers no, we went two what? different, very different ways there. <laughs> <laughs> what are you bringing in us? Firestorm Death Watch. Let's go. Okay. Using only Jeremy? Death Watch units? No. What the fuck do you think I am? I'm still going to try and win the casual meme list event. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was just going to say uh, I'm going to bring uh, five carnivores and three rampages because it fits. I think six and three actually fits. I'm going to bring three Tesseract Vaults. Oh, no, it's three and three. Never mind. Three Tesseract Vaults and the Silent King? God damn it. Three Tesseract Vaults <laughs> anyways. I'm going to bring three Tesseract Vaults anyways. Because fuck you guys. I'm bringing my casual Death Company list. Lamar, he's in 30 Jump Death Company and uh, 30 Foot Death Company. Yeah, but okay. all the Death Company are only, exist are only equipped with Bolt Pistols and Chain Swords. No. Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> in re casual... reality, they are, yes. Um... Do we think Redeemers will see a point increase? They seem very common. What are your hopes for the Shield Host rewrite? Please, for the fucking love of Christ, put them up like 30 points. I don't think Why Redeemers do think will change at all. And the main reason I don't think they're going to change at all is that Marines are struggling right now. And so... That's a joke. They're so stupid. Now, the Grey Knight Redeemer, on the other hand, that could go up like 40 points. Yeah, make everybody play the Banisher. <laughs> <laughs> Does not think you don't have rules anymore? Yeah, the Banisher is one of the like only non. Uh, it has a twin psi cannon that's not psychic, doesn't ignore cover, and is AP one, uh, and uh, two uh, two heavy psi uh, two heavy um, flamers as the, or uh, heavy. What are they called? Incinerators as sponsors. There you go. My as for the shield host rewrite, I just I don't want them to dominate melee. I don't want them to have fight first anymore. No more reactive fight first. I want that gone. I hope that um, they give you access to a six-up field of pain against mortal wounds only, no dev wounds. Uh, I hope that it removes all of your data sheet abilities to give you that. Um, I hope it's the only one that's playable, and it also requires you to go up to, to pay 10 additional points for every model that you want to bring that has the custodies keyword. So every like, you bring the first one, it's 50, the second one is 60, the next one is 70, and it's per model. All right, Ines. Um, the next question's for Anthony, but we're going to ask it. We're going to ask it anyways. Just finished building and painting your Blood Angels list for an upcoming GT in May. Do you think Death Company is going to get hit in the balance data slate before then? Nothing worse than a pre-tournament nerf. What's yes. the next? And then what's the next step if DSC get hit hard? I don't think they'll get hit hard, but I think they will get hit because they are too good right now. Look, you could put Death Company up five points a model, and I'd still play. I'd still play ten. What if you uh, lost? What if you only got rerolls in melee? I would still play ten. I would maybe just consider running like five with hammers and five. With, I'd still run exactly the same squad. Fuck it. I mean, infernal pistols are a hell of a drug. And the moment, baby. What else is it for? <laughs> you can still get reroll hits. Like it's not like I'm losing them. Uh, that's from the last questions were from Mark and from Bryn. Uh, and then Coco or Jack says, so with the world on fire and everything being shit, how's the outlook on the current ethos of new codexes? I actually think Fine. the world isn't on fire. I mean, the world itself is on fire. But yeah, but that's because the, the sun is a deadly is... laser. There are lots of reasons, but we'll say that one for now um, and keep <laughs> this a mildly non mildly. Outside. I think the idea that Codex has broadened your range of options without increasing the power of your army is completely fine and more people should be okay with it. I Giving agree. you more ways to play an army that's exactly as powerful as it was before maybe a little bit less because you have a bunch more options and re reactability now is a better way to do Codexes than to ramp everything up to 14 every time a new book comes out. I will also add that it's okay for the indexes to be stronger than the Codexes because it means that the indexes continue to be relevant against codex armies this is actually an analysis someone has asked me to do and i'm probably going to do in the next couple weeks is compare 
uh, index versus codex armies over the last like I'll probably do it in like May, and, but like over the last like four months and be, and be like, did like Marines getting a codex help or hurt them against the index armies? Did Tyranids and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. yeah. And again, like being able to adapt your book with less with more options and more things is power. It's not power one to one, but it's power against the meta. The fact that cannot that Necron players can flex between so many different options and builds to responding to what else is good right now is power. If you only have one book, one build with one index, and it gets hit or it changes or the meta just responds to it, you don't have a ton of options. Whereas Necrons, you know, if people suddenly start taking super hard into precision to deal with wraiths, you can move into a hypercurt build or something similar, which is you know breadth not depth and breadth is another form of power that is less obvious but just as important the next question is from logan and uh, not from logan it's from eric uh, i guess also is the tau book intentionally written wrong or will it be day one faq'd also so the question that is being asked here is with regards to uh monka which currently only works if you already have an assault weapon on your unit which i can almost guarantee you is not how it's intended to be used the other one, and this is a more open-ended question, is whether you get the lethals all five turns or just the three that you're in, Monka. I hate that one players. is a bigger one. I don't know. Why are why are these questions people are asking? Obviously no, and obviously no. Come on, people. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Eric like asks ask a question, question which is they, because they want to be punched in the face. I don't get it. <laughs> People sometimes ask questions that they want the answer that they want to, not the answer that is most logical. And sometimes people just want to hear someone else confirm for them that they're not crazy. Or that we're now authorities. <laughs> <laughs> we're now authorities in this Warhammer space, apparently, of some kind, just by popularity. Oh, come on, Jeremy. Uh, what do you guys think the three strongest singles lists are at this moment? Canoptic Court. So Iron Storm, Black Templars, Sons of Sons of Sanguinius, Canoptic Court, and Thousand Sons. Hmm. And I would pro well, maybe guard. Yeah, but, but we're not... now we're into like five. But yeah, they're they're yeah. they're up there. Canoptic is far and above ahead of the rest. Same with BT Iron Storm. Stats wise, it is. <laughs> like maybe Blood see. Angels players just suck in us. That's also probably true. Run more Death the, Company, guys. They're good, the, I promise. That's just going to mean more Death Company Dreadnoughts, and you know it. That's Don't do that. <laughs> don't do that to yourself. Davos, I'm looking uh, at you. <laughs> the next question is from Sam God, Lemon, God. which is, with five-man teams, what is your thoughts on w the win threshold differential-wise being 53 points instead of the traditional 55 for a round win? Um, We're changing the win threshold differential from 55 to 53. I personally have used 54 in five anties before because it's if you divide the WC 86 threshold by eight and times it by five, it is 10. It's like 53.75, which I rounded up to 54. Yeah. Um, so in case anyone's wondering, the default in BCP, if you just use the WTC scorecard for a team event, is 11 points per player up to six players. And after that, it is um, 10 points per player plus six or plus five for yeah. plus six for a win. It makes it like the basically the higher you set the threshold, the more likely you are to have draws because correct. It makes and I've I've played in events where they've done fifty one, where they've done fifty two, where they've done fifty three, and where they've done fifty five. I've never actually played fifty four. Uh, fifty one is wild, and I think should never be done. Fifty one is insane. That's why that's what ITT does in the UK, and I cannot stand it. It's yeah. so strange. Fifty three or fifty five, like you'll get more draws with fifty five than with fifty three. I don't think it's instead of 54 then i was smart i was right i don't exactly think that it's that WCC. impactful because there are like if you look at your average five-man team events and go through it there are very few that are in that 53 to 55 range i will say um if you go and look at uh alpine there were so many draws at 56 56 is too high um frankly Wait, i would say 55 56 56 is what alpine used yep oh baby yeah, it was rough. It was the same. You needed the same points gap at WTC with three less players. Um, you needed to win by, you know, 12 points. Yeah, that is a bit. It that is a bit too much. Rough. Why is it so important that there be ties? Uh, let's just answer this right now. To give people something to play for in tough rounds and in losing matchups, to make the importance of pushing and pushing failing be more important, um, it just creates more stratification between teams. It gives more of a 
like emphasis on getting like tight pairings. Like you can, you have more to play for in losses, uh, more room for recovery. It just creates for a more interesting yep. texture. Uh, and generally. it's a further extrapolation of the differential nature of the exactly. whole team's event, where it's like you don't just win by beating your your opponent's team by one point. You beat them by a differential of at least a certain amount. The next question is from Eric, and I'm going to answer this question because I think it's funny. What do you think your worst there? first takes from the balance data slate were, and why is it that world leaders were trash? Look, so I don't they actually... They are bad in singles, I actually think. They're not great in singles. They're, like, fine in singles. They have a 46% win rate. They've won a couple events since the last data slate. Their overrep is 0 0.69, which is under the threshold we've been talking nice. about for them being good. Yeah, nice. Um, but I think they're really good in teams, obviously. And if you're Anthony and are a premium member of the World Leaders Club, then they're probably good in your hands. But they aren't doing amazing. I don't think they got nerfed out of existence, which we were wrong about because we did talk about them getting nerfed. Oh, that like, was CSM. Of I think we were wrong about that CSM definitely. being like broadly like playable still. CSM are dog mm -hmm. shit. Mm -hmm. That I think except, is true. We were, except in Germany. We definitely were yeah, the I think most we went wrong a about CSM. This. There will probably still be a CSM build. There just kind of didn't end up being one that came together quite abruptly. There's definitely like some like C tier stuff in there, but there's nothing that's like standing out. They um, still have more GT wins than Tyranids. That's true. I think we also like the, the turret points left for a fucking joke. Uh, I've which been, has I, a, I think we spent that at the time. So, which has a better matchup into guard, Blood Angels or Lion Storm? BA into guard has been fine in my broad experience. Like it's in that close game, but you can definitely win. Band Lion Storm is, I mean, it's pretty flippy. They don't have great answers for like getting ran at by Kazakin and Bulgren behind walls and they can sometimes struggle to get OC onto it but so can, this is the, there, there is there is a there is a clarifying point here because this is Ben who's asking this because this is for GW terrain not WTC terrain GW terrain you cannot hide from the storm ravens hey flip 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 but it's not that's the thing because I've played this and the guard players hate the existence of the dark shroud because it changes all of their internal math on being able to kill vehicles normally that's fair. I mean, to not just focus the dark shroud of turn one and stage enough that it's not you, terrifying. You can hope that you kill it. Mm -hmm. Minus one damage is rough to get through sometimes. Dark shrouds don't have minus one damage. No, dark shrouds oh, don't, but yeah. everything else in the army does. Yeah. Um, in my experience, it is probably about the same in terms of blood, blood angels and, and lion storm. I think blood angels are a little bit more reliable in terms of they have a higher floor, um, but I would say lion storm has a higher ceiling. I did not enjoy getting shot by tank commanders when I was playing Storm Ravens. That was not pleasant. I, that is miserable. It sucks ass. I hate it. <laughs> I didn't mind it at all. <laughs> all right. Next question um, is Isaac, which is, what's your thoughts on tournaments hiding missions till after list lock? A decent chunk of events in the Pacific Northwest like doing this so you don't tailor your lists in quotation marks. I think that's the dumbest weird, idea ever. Look, man, why do you hate territory players? Let them know if they're playing parts the four and ha. <laughs> And, and also just like let your players plan for the missions that they're playing because that is part of what building a good list for a tournament is about saying that there's going to be a mission there's going to be five missions out of the 18 that are in the leviathan tournament companion to per tournament companion is not going to be good for your players I there's more than seven missions jesus yeah and that's exactly <laughs> it like wtc we know all the missions ahead of time uh gw you technically don't at the u.s opens but you do because they're always the same ones you just don't know for the first one i if i need to know if your tournament is running servo skulls before i know if i'm signing up or not that <laughs> frankly that's a very important factor as well <laughs> I Wait, after we... list lock is i don't think it's a good idea i don't think it's good for the health of the game um and yes can hammer chimes in when they hide missions and servo skulls is in. I can't think of what event would have done that recently. If you hide a mission and I have to play servo skulls, I'm I'm demanding a ticket refund and I'll take it out of your skin if I have to. We for our RTTs, we hide all the missions until this lock. I won't but we never do servo skulls. But that's not fine because you an RTT. We're playing from yeah. this set in the pack. Like hey, yeah. we're picking from these ten. Fine. If I know that servo skulls isn't there, that's fine. If it's not in your pack, Nathan, you're a horrible human being. 
if what's not in our pack? The, the fact set that, that you're, you're, you're not from. playing server squads. Oh, the people know what we're choosing from, and they know what our terrain looks like. There you go. Um, stat check. You often say not a real army. Which two armies are the most real armies, and which two armies are the least real armies? There are no real armies. There's only things that we judge on the day in the moment. Um, every army is not a real army if I'm feeling particular, if I don't feel like it that day. Or if I want to make my point more solidly or with more like emphasis. The most real army real. is Canoptic Court because it wins the most. The yeah, least real army is Death Watch because it wins nothing. Basically, when I say real army, it means am I respecting it if I showed up and I paired it? Uh, and yeah. So anything that my list beats right now isn't a real army. Anything my list loses to is a real army. All right, right now, now we've got thumbs are very real. We're not going to blast through the starred questions by starting with the super chat questions and then going to the non super chat questions and see how far we get. First one is from Daniel Paulini. Thank you for the five dollar super chat. I think this counts as a question about questions, but seriously, for eight man events, what would the must take factions be and what would attacker defender lists be? So I'm going to say this right now, Dan, just sl slide back into my DMs if you're trying to build your team for BFS. We've already been talking about this, but more seriously, um, depends what terrain you're playing on. Since this is for BFS, they have a very distinct map pack as opposed to WTC. Uh, depends on what you factions you have available, because not every team is going to have those. But I would say at a minimum, you are going to need Necrons. You are probably going to need Space Marines of some variant. You are going to need Sisters. Um, help me out, guys. Eldar? You don't need Eldar. I would say no. um, I would say Marines, Guard, Necrons, Thousand Sons, and um that's probably it. And then I think you need like one or two of the heavy draw lists, which are like sisters, death guard, um, certain gray knight builds, and then you probably want like one or two other big push attackers, something like world eaters, the other kinds of gray knight builds. Um you know, something in like those range. But I would say the, the big four right now for me are guard, marines, necrons, and Thousand sons. Yeah, no, I'd agree. Um, it does require you to have a player who can play those armies. Um, guard, yeah, I think for each one of them, it, it is it is actually important that they know what they're doing with that army. Not for guard, but other than that, yeah. <laughs> All right. Knight Tenth also has a super chat. Thank you for the four ninety nine. I'm looking to get coached in the near future. What's the best way to pick my coach? I have more of a reactive slash defense play style. Uh, GK, you guys are awesome. My genuine suggestion with this would be go and listen to the people that you're considering talk about Warhammer in some like vaguely more serious context and just see if you like the way they like approach things and if it sounds like they'll solve problems in a way you like, then reach out to them and just speak to them. Ask to, you know, like speak to them for like on a call for 50 minutes if you can um, and to just like get an idea of what they're at or just chat back and forth on Discord a bunch. But if you're interested in speaking to someone, whether it's us or War Vanguard, just talk to them. They're like, you're never going to be able to figure it out without just seeing them do it at least a little bit. Or do a one-off session for like a 30-minute call or an hour call before you commit to doing long-term. Yep. Existence 40K asks the next question, which is points only. It would... Oh, man. It, when it disappears like that, it really tweaks my brain out a little bit. Points only, it would appear. How are you bringing up the lower fractions with only points changes? Um, I think it's hard, actually. Because you can only you can only offset points so much to the point where it doesn't mean anything anymore. And some of the factions, I think, at the bottom need rules changes and not points changes. I think the way you do it is you make expensive units a lot cheaper. Um, rather than hitting, like, dropping a point off of the battle line that everybody takes in every list gives the army 30 more points back, and that's great. But it does encourage a lower play style and definitely does result in sometimes you just be like, oh, well, 120, this is now the best thing. If you pick all the data sheets that are, like, way too expensive and just, like, outrageously drop them, you at least start introducing, like, new builds and new lists. I think, honestly, like, the Tau Reptide is the best example of this. It wasn't an army that needed it, but the Reptile was unplayable garbage at, what was it, like 240? And mm -hmm. it's now 160, and it's great. Like, pick a unit like that, whether it's, you know, in Admech, it's the Castle and Robots, and they're, what, like 110 points each or something stupid right now? Drop them to 80. Fucking nobody's playing them. It doesn't matter. If they're still garbage, drop them more. But it brings out a new build. It makes make the centerpieces make the centerpiece models more playable so that people are encouraged to build around them and then drop small points on the worst of the shaft scoring units to introduce options for marines i'd be looking at stuff like um you're talking like the big stupid melee units that nobody plays from the core codex like terminators drop the like marine terminators like 20 points per five or something like that just to like see if it makes them playable you don't want to make intercessors <laughs> 60 points i get it right it could be could go wrong but it's less likely to go wrong on big units with like big units with drastic points drops are such a lower percentage of your army and percentage of their points we're dropping 
five points off of a squad of intercessors might just suddenly be like you know 30 intercessors armies obnoxious as fuck to deal with with the right buffs and the right detachment um i'm you're always like the lower the lower your points a unit is the more dangerous it is to drop these points take the big stupid things make them cheaper drop points on i know that like fuck i mean like fuck iron storm because it makes marines hard but you know, rep x's repulsors the regular land raider land raider crusader um not the storm raven sorry storm raven but like assault terminators like regular terminators the regular terminator kit is gorgeous it's dog shit make them you know you could probably put them into like 30 points a model it'd probably be weird but i don't think you'd think it'd be that bad that data sheet fucking sucks um for armies like yeah for admec i would be looking at some of the like the like the fucking planes i know the buffing planes is always dangerous but they're terrible <laughs> make the tanks cheaper like the seriously tanks, yeah. because the, the archer, you look at all drop call 40 points what the fuck's gonna go it's called busted in an army call is so Admech expensive it's so bad for nids look at stuff like swarm lord norns um you know you can't drop gargoyles like every list already plays them but mm -hmm. make norns cheaper make um swarm lord cheaper make the interesting melee beasts like you know it's probably a little much on the horror specs it's already very cheap at 125 it still sucks but drop the trigon you know but go with big points drops don't just fucking hail here and there five times do what you like, did to the tyrann effects to other big books exactly do what you did to the riptide drop it 40 points and see if it just uh, bring the dimacaron back bring no. the dimacaron back 100 percent um just trying to think of like another army to give an example in if i was looking what's another army that kind of sucks right now CSM. Like, yeah, CSM. I'd be looking at stuff like Abaddon, right? Like, you want to make, you know, put Abaddon down, put um, Mauler Fiends down, right? The big stuff that nobody plays. Vashtor. Make Vashtor 50 points cheaper. What the fuck? Nothing's going to go wrong. The <laughs> <actually> unplayable <laughs> garbage that nobody's seen, drop it 25% and see if people start playing it. It'll introduce breadth without, like, if there are play issues that nobody plays, there is almost nothing that can go wrong with just dropping them, like, an almost stupid amount because they're not played for a reason. And yeah, next if you question. Get it wrong one place here and there per codex, it makes a build. <laughs> the questions are disappearing in front of my eyes. James Workshop asks, "Are you happy with the balance?" Question. We've done this one. Like Mark, the I think it needs addressing. Again, like two weeks. I want the the summary statement of our stat section today was yes, but there are still yes, but is basically the summary statement for that section. Yes, but it could be better. Yeah. Uh, the next question is from uh, man. I don't know. A tread. Lol. Uh, is there a waiting system assigned to event player count? Uh, nope. No. Next question is from Friend Man. How do you all feel about Thousand Suns in the current meta? Pretty good if you're a skilled pilot. Is They're basically really the summary from earlier discussions. You want you want a general uh, overview? Stop picking minus one damage. Start picking plus two movement and go and fucking kill them. And uh, you you'll go. do really well with Thousand Suns. Next one's from Probably Coco. Does asking about someone's favorite flavor of egg count as a shit question? No, we answer that question flavor, like every week yes. with every guess. If you ask I mean, flavor, favorite flavor of egg, yes, that is a shit question. You ask it's Cadbury cream egg. egg? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, and now so we're going to do the trailing off part because all my questions are now gone and I'm not answering any more questions. Um, so we're going to do the part of the show where I say go back to the plugs that were like 15 minutes ago if you want to see all the plugs for the show. Now I'm going to thank all the people from the $15 a month tier with their silly nonsense that they give me to thank them with. And I'm going to do my best not to forget anybody this week, but I'm going to forget somebody inevitably and then uh, we'll sign off. All right. So at the end of every show, we, among other benefits that you get for me seeing us in person, including a crisp high five from any of us, a uh, kiss on the cheek from Typhus and from Pumba, uh, and People other... People that in Alpine. We had, we, we had some stuff going down. It was great. <clears throat> yep. So yeah, you can get a crisp high five, and then you get thanked at the end of our episodes with basically whatever you put here is what you want to be thanked by. Um, so congratulations and sorry, I guess. And then apparently people like it that I do this. I don't know, man. Join the $15 a month tier and tell me you want be, to be an emoji in our thank you part. So without further ado, uh, thank you, Fungus. Thank you, Citronaut Emoji. Thank you, Dan F. Thank you, Archon Rahal. Uh, thank you, Luke. Thank you, Mr. Pig. Thank you, Pig Emoji. Uh, thank you, David Clark. Thank you, Ayer. I know I forgot you last week. I'm very sorry about that. I promise I will do better next time. Uh, thank you, Chris. And, but also thank you, Unicorn Emoji, Scottish Flag Emoji, Chris W. Emoji. Um, <laughs> I'm never doing that ever again. I probably forgot somebody. You if did, and I'm going to give you a few more. 
So oh, I want to say it. thanks to that one guy, John. I want to say there thanks to Jack Daniel Morris. I want to say thanks to Josiah Gaddle. Uh, and I believe that now is most of them. I'm sure that between the two of us, we have still person. missed them. I think we got one more person. I'm going to open up Patreon real quick. It, and look at my we only shut them out if they have given us permission to, however. And then thank you to the person who just upgraded theirs, but I don't have permission to say your name, so I'm not going to shout you out. But thank you for just upgrading during this show to the $15 a month tier. Um, I will at some point create like a localized list of these, but it probably won't happen anytime soon because it's kind of fun to just fuck this up on there. <laughs> um, and then finally, thank you everybody for watching our show. I hope you all have a wonderful week. Be good to one another. And here is your crisp high five. Are you sure you can do that? No. But bye bye. Did they really?